So when all of this kicked off, I'm a relatively bright guy, but when all of this kicked off, um, I told my, and this being COVID, I told my um, money manager, I said, look, I want to be as close to my money being buried in the backyard as humanly possible. And she just kept saying, you don't understand inflation. Like this is going to be a problem. Like your money will go down in value. And I was like, I get it, but I feel like it's happening slowly enough that I've got time to like get my head together. Like this is so disruptive and so, um, you know, Bill Gates predicted it. So I won't say it was unpredictable, but it was so surprising and unlike anything I had ever lived through. I just didn't know what was going to happen. And I didn't understand money markets well enough or finance in general. I'd always bet on myself as an entrepreneur. So I understand how to build business. I understand how to create wealth, but maintaining it is like a whole nother thing that honestly, I know a little bit about now. I knew nothing about it then. So I just kept saying, look, get me as close to buried in the backyard as I can. Then I come across you and you talk about hurdle rate. And then I was like, oh my God, this isn't something I've got 30 years to figure out. This is something I have four years to figure out to get to like a halfway point to where I've already lost 50% of my wealth. So I was like, whoa, now I have to take action. So now I start researching like crazy, okay, is it gonna be crypto? Is it gonna be specifically Bitcoin? Is it gonna be something else? And this idea of creating, basically turning sunlight into cryptographically protected money is a, a very interesting idea. And so I'd like to know now, so those are all the reasons why like there's, you can protect yourself from the government, um, but you have a compelling argument as to why I should be willing to stomach sort of short-term volatility and why, because that's like the argument. If I'm that average person on the street, I'm like, yo, literally last week, this lost like 30 or 40% of its value. So that's terrifying. So why would I be better off in that than, you know, even a bond with a negative yield, at least like I'm bleeding to death more slowly than the 35% loss or whatever that I just took over the last week? Well, Bitcoin's the best performing asset for the past decade. And it's, you know, it's, 100x better than gold, and it's 10x better than uh, equity portfolios. So the volatility is the price you pay for the performance that you get. And uh, oftentimes the best investment idea isn't the most comfortable investment idea. Um, I, I think um, if I told you there's 100% certainty you are going to lose 7% of your money over the course of a year, you might think, well, you know, I have a decade before I lose half of my money. I have time to think about it. That's the, that's the status quo when monetary inflation is 7%. If I told you there's a 100% probability that you're going to lose 20% of your money over the next year and half of your money over the next three years, well, I mean, you might think you need to move faster. Well, what if I told you you're going to lose all your money? What if I told you the currency is going to collapse to zero in three months? which is kind of what it did in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Or what if I told you we're going to have 95% inflation? I think the unofficial inflation rate in Argentina is like 85% this year. What if I told you we're going to have hyperinflation? Everything will be twice as expensive next year. Now, how long would you wait before you took a risk? I, I can, you know, if I really want to, you know, get you to jump out of the pot, right? I could just make it simple. Next Tuesday, I'm seizing all your money. Or you can spend it between now and next Tuesday, right? What, I mean, that really, uh, what is the word? Focuses one, right? <laughs> right, it strengthens one, it stiffens one's spine and focuses one. If I just made it very black and white, I'm just going to take all your money next Tuesday or you can spend it between now and then. So how do you actually... Um, get comfortable with the volatility. Well, I think first you have to get, you have to understand how big your problem is. And the second thing is one of time horizon. And what are your, what's your aspirational goal? For example, if you're, if you don't aspire to change your lifestyle one iota, and you know, you're gonna watch Netflix, let's say stream, you're gonna live in your parents' basement, watch Netflix, order Domino's pizza and stream YouTube video for the rest of your life. Do you have an inflation problem coming? Probably not. If you wanna, if you wanna buy your own house, 
you have a bigger inflation problem because housing went up 15 percent. If you want to get married, buy a house, have three kids, and if you know if you want to take expensive vacations and have a have a house on the lake, you have a big inflation problem. Guess what? Luxury homes on the lake went up in price a lot. Same with education. If I plan to send those kids to school, I'm really in trouble. Yeah, so it really comes down to what is your aspiration, and that that determines your hurdle rate. I mean, what you want determines your inflation rate, and your inflation rate determines your hurdle rate, and that makes a difference. I think uh, in terms of historic metaphors, I mean, there's plenty. For example, my family came to, um, to the United States in 1736 on a wooden ship. Okay, and if you if you want to go study those voyages, they spent eight weeks. Have you ever tried? There's not a single person that's like probably got in a wooden ship with three sails for eight weeks to cross the North Atlantic in order to come to America. The mortality rate is like two to five percent on that trip. Whoa. The mortality rate to go from Europe to the Far East is like 35 percent. It's insane. Whoa. Like one out of three people that started the journey dies on the trip. Whoa. Okay, so, the, you know, we talk about volatility. Is Bitcoin bumpy? Is crypto? Um, we're just talking about Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin is bumpy. What else is bumpy? Yeah, wooden ships in 15-foot seas. If you want the definition of a rocky ride. The, the rocky ride was, was leaving Europe. So... Why'd they do it? So you're saying that the bold are the ones rewarded? If you choose correctly, right? I mean, uh, the ones that moved too soon, you know, went to certain colonies, you know, that on the Potomac River and the James River and they died, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of early settlers who took arrows in their back, you know, in the 1600s. On the other hand, uh, by the mid 17, 1700s, by 1736, you know, people had been living in, a, in North America and you had Philadelphia and, and you had Massachusetts, successful colony and the like. So if you choose the right decision or make the right decision at the right time, you can have a better life, but there's still risk. Right. So why do people come from Europe? They came for property rights and civil rights. Right. They either couldn't exercise their religion or there was no hope for them. All the property was owned by someone else. And, the, you know, property rights matter. If I a lot of people don't realize this, they think that they, they think that property rights are a nice to have. Property rights are a nice to have the same way that that fat on your frame or an insulin are a nice to have. If I strip away your insulin, you're a type one diabetic. You can't form fat. If you can't form fat, you can eat all day long and you're going to starve to death. It's not a nice to have to store to store energy over time. Fat is an organic energy battery and property is a social energy battery. So being able to store property means I can go three months without a job and not starve and live and live a life. There is no hope for a, a civil life without property. So. You know, people went from Europe to the U.S. for property. When they got to the East Coast, they went west. It's in the American ethos. Was there a bumpy ride taking a wagon train over the Rocky Mountains? You ever fly over the Rocky Mountains and look down before they had the railroad and before they had the highways? And then you ask, how did people actually cover the turf? It's like, yes, it was a bumpy ride. There was volatility along the way. You know, I think the risk and the discomfort today of owning Bitcoin is a heck of a lot less than the risk and the discomfort of getting in a ship or getting on a horse or, you know, getting in a wagon or walking, right, or settling and doing what you need to in order to secure your civil rights and your property rights and your freedom. But um, there is an analogy um, the only way you make the volatility go away is you make the opportunity go away. Mm. The, the reason you went west was because people weren't living there and you wanted thousands of acres to yourself to live a better life, right? And when you got there, you found that there was no one that had come before you to, you know, to clear the thing, you know, and build a house for you and give you running water and hand the keys to you and do your bidding. Because... You know, you were going to a new place. That was where the opportunity was. So I, th I think it's very, 
it's very uh, quintessential to the American spirit or the, or the entrepreneurial spirit or, or, or just the human spirit. You know, what about immigrants, a nation made of immigrants? People went from a country where they had nothing to a country where they could have something. That's the story that you see over and over again. Is there volatility? Is there a risk? Yeah, always, right? Um, is there opportunity? Yeah. When do you leave? Look, the, I mean, the rich first sons of the nobles in Europe didn't come. <laughs> yeah, it was the poor, disenfranchised, the, the people that uh, that didn't have a choice that came. Right. The, the Protestants left Catholic countries. The Catholics left Protestant countries. The poor left every country. Those who were, you know, hoping for a better life came. And you know, if you're if you're sitting wealthy with lots and lots of stuff and a comfortable lifestyle and a comfortable portfolio, you might not see the same impetus, right? You wouldn't have the same inspiration to do something. It's interesting. So the humanitarian side of this is one of the things that I find more fascinating about the Bitcoin movement. Um, there is something very encouraging about the fact that all the people in my life that came to me with this saying, Tom, you really have to look at this, were young people. Um, you know, the level of awareness that they have had that, and I have a lot of employees that sort of straddle, are they the low, low end of um, gen uh, millennials? Or are they the upper end of Gen Z? You know, I guess it depends on where you split it, but they're sort of early 20s. And, uh, you know, they're looking at this as like, hey, this is, this is the opportunity our generation has been looking for. There's finally a moment where we can really capture some upside. We're young enough that if we sort of invest poorly, it should be fine, that we should be able to make this money back up. They buy into the ethos of only invest what you're prepared to lose. You know, these aren't guys that are doing things on leverage. Um, and so that is is very hopeful. You know, when you talk about the beginning of the pandemic was this wealth transfer to people that basically owned bonds and assets. And now with, you know, hopefully the sort of prolonged. And I think that's an important thing to note is, yes, there's volatility to Bitcoin in the short term. I've heard you say if you're looking at a number in anything less than a four year increment, it's just noise. And that once you extend out to four years and beyond, suddenly it actually becomes a, a story of you know, growing, I think it's like 200% year over year, um, which is, you know, pretty thrilling. Um, how far does, when you think about this being sort of the apex um, property, how much goes into just the, the fact that it's taking sunlight and turning it into something that's cryptographically protected? And how much of that stance is that this evens the playing field? You know, I, th I think of Bitcoin as like that shining city in cyberspace where billions of people will eventually want to live, right? Instead of moving from Europe to America or moving from the old world to the new world or whatever, or moving from the planet to cyberspace. We can't move to outer space yet. I can't get a billion people off the planet and settle on a better Earth. But I can move a billion people to cyberspace Bitcoin is property in cyberspace. It's 21 million city blocks in cyber Manhattan. Um, the people that move there first, right, get to buy the land cheapest. And then, you know, how many people will eventually want to live there? Well, unlike Manhattan, where there's a limit, there's really no limit. Why wouldn't everybody want to live there, right? I mean, I don't know that there won't be other cities in cyberspace that, that might meet other needs. I mean, I, I suppose if the Chinese, you know, made it illegal to own Bitcoin, but there was a Chinese Bitcoin, there might be a Chinese version of Bitcoin in cyberspace, kind of like Alibaba, you know, and Ant and, and WeChat kind of branched off from Facebook and Google and Amazon. So there might be some other digital dominant monetary networks or dominant monetary networks, but, but Bitcoin is the greatest, <coughs> the greatest um, monetary network that the hum, human race has ever developed. And it's certainly the dominant one right now. And it looks like it's going to be continued to be the dominant one for as long as we live. So um, what makes it uh, dominant? Well, I mean, clearly the, the architecture is uh, proof of work, or in other words, th throwing up a wall of encrypted energy, right? 
it's all of uh, the crypto hash power that's channeling energy through the hashing function, which creates uh, creates the stability and the security. And so it's based upon the architecture, but um, but ultimately the appeal of it is that it's an open permissionless protocol that everybody on earth can engage in. Anybody can mine it. Anybody can, so anybody can contribute security to the network and anybody can run their own node and anybody can own it. And then any company uh, can plug into it. And so there's nothing that open. There is no... You know, there is no monetary protocol or asset or currency that is so open as the Bitcoin asset. And so that's what's driving its value right now. It's, it, it's an opportunity for people that, are, that have little, that have uh, little to lose and much to gain. It's, all, it's an opportunity for everybody, though. I mean, the way I think of it is it's a moral imperative, a technical imperative and an economic imperative. Morally, it's an imperative because it's it's the best hope for eight billion people to secure their property rights. If I give you a fifty dollar Android phone, you can carry around in the Android wallet your property, and no bank or no hostile regime can seize it. And we've never and, and that's the best property right you're ever going to get. I think it's a technical imperative for the same reason. You've got eight billion mobile phones. That will all have property and so what's more important storing your photos and your videos on your mobile phone or storing all your money all your life force on your mobile phone i mean you're worried about losing the photos you took on your iphone or you worried about losing your life savings clearly it's more valuable so so it's a it's a technology imperative for an apple and amazon and google and facebook and companies like square and paypal and binance and coinbase are already extraordinarily successful by embracing it. You can see that right now. And finally, it's an economic imperative because there's $500 trillion worth of uh, fiat derivatives, cash and bonds and stocks and real estate that's valued based upon cash flows. And all of those things are being devalued at 1% a month, something. So we, we can go back and forth over what's the rate of currency expansion, but you know, it's, it's not that hard to see that this is a 25 to 50 trillion dollar a year problem for anybody with assets on Earth. Mm. It's very rare that you find a, a technology that's the solution to every rich person's problem and every poor person's problem simultaneously. What do you say to people that that say um, the pushback I've seen on Bitcoin is, hey, guys, sorry, I get why you're excited about it, but it's the Netscape of crypto. And, uh, you know, just as a, a technological layer, it was early, cool, yay, thanks for sort of proving the model, but this is never gonna last. People will build something way better. Yeah, well, Netscape didn't make it to a trillion dollars in market value in 10 years, <laughs> right? Uh, if, we, if, we, if we calculate the amount of monetary energy on the network, Bitcoin would be more successful than Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, or Microsoft. In fact, it would be more, and it's, you know, much more successful than, than Netscape or AOL or anything from that genre. Those things never got to one one hundredth, right? I think Netscape, you know, at its peak, you know, was maybe one twentieth, one thirtieth, one fortieth of what we're seeing in front of us right now. And uh, the, the difference really is, there is no other, uh, there is no technology and architecture that's, uh, that's appropriate to replace it. The solution to the issue of long duration asset or long duration safe haven store of value is, is a very secure crypto asset network. And so Bitcoin is the single most secure network in the world. It's the most secure database in the world. It's the most secure asset in the world. The way that you make it secure is through the an extraordinary decentralization combined with uh, the way that it uh, that it converts energy into a very special specialized SHA-256 hash function. So in order to attack that network, it would take extraordinary time and effort and energy and resources. It's 
it's pretty much the most secure thing we've got in cyberspace. And what about people that look at that and go, yes, cool, you've built this amazing protective layer, but it comes at the cost of the environment? The actual cost is, um, you know, nominally 0.1% of the energy used in the world, but the economic value of the energy is not even 10 basis points, it's like three basis points. So you're talking about like, it's almost, if you put it on a sheet of paper, it would be like a, a couple of dots, but you can't even see it. The, uh, the overall energy generated in the, in the economy is like 160,000 terawatt hours, and the wasted energy is 50,000 terawatt hours, and Bitcoin is 120 out of 50,000 wasted energy. So it, it really is insignificant as an energy load on the environment. But if you dig a bit deeper, you'll find that actually Bitcoin is much cleaner energy than all the rest of the applications. Cars, planes, trains, automobiles. It's pretty obvious uh, planes use fossil fuels. There's no hope for them not to. Bitcoin doesn't. Bitcoin is actually something that runs on electricity. It doesn't run on fossil fuels. You know, most cars still use fossil fuels and even electric cars are charged at charging stations that are charged with fossil fuels. So, so the environmentalists ultimately are going to focus upon the energy grid and if they want to shut down fossil fuels or change the energy mix away from coal or something, they'll do that. Bitcoin uh, is the highest value application of energy on a wholesale basis that we have in the world. There's nothing, nothing more valuable, there's no more valuable use of energy than Bitcoin. The latest generation of SHA-256 miners, they will generate almost 45 cents a kilowatt hour in value, which means you can take them anywhere on Earth to the North Pole, you can put a nuclear reactor on the North Pole and run, and run Bitcoin mining from it, you can plug them into wind generators a thousand miles out into a desert. You can plug them into geothermal on an island like Iceland. And you can generate 45 cents a kilowatt hour. The typical residential electricity cost is 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Industrial usage in the first world is 11 cents a kilowatt hour. And all that energy has to be co-located with the factories and the people. Right. We don't, you know, we don't have an application, an industrial application of energy like Bitcoin that you can put anywhere on Earth. So what's the result? The result is that Bitcoin is used to recycle stranded energy or wasted energy. If you have um, if you have a hydroelectric dam and you have a lot of energy, but you don't have people to use it. Well, the dam is generating energy year round, but the people don't need it. But maybe a few months a year, or maybe they don't need it in the evening, they just need it during the day to run their air conditioners. Like air conditioning is a great example of a cycling energy use. Bitcoin is perfect a perfect energy uh, battery because you can run it at night while the people are asleep and the air conditioning is off. And so you level out energy consumption on the grid, thereby driving down the cost of energy for everybody on Earth. And for any, any plant that would otherwise be decommissioned, you have a use for it if you don't want to decommission it. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, the sun shines in the desert where people don't live, and the wind blows in places where people don't live, and volcanoes you know, and geothermal energy exist where people don't want to live. Those are three sources of energy. They're all sustainable, renewable energy. But if you know anything about a power engineering, you know, you can't move electricity more than 500 miles on a grid, period. It's a hard stop, a hard limit. If you happen to find geothermal energy more than 500 miles from Manhattan, we don't need it. And, and uh, newsflash, we've already got too much energy, right? So even if you found geothermal energy in the middle of Central Park, we still don't need it. And so what if I told you, Tom, I've actually got infinite free sustainable energy and it's a thousand miles away from a city. What are you going to do with it? Well, the, I mean, the, the only obvious thing to do with it is Bitcoin mining. So Bitcoin is migrating to the ends of the earth to the most sustainable energy, which is also the cheapest energy, which is also the greenest energy. And, um, and it's a solution 
to the problem of how do we catalyze sustainable energy, how do we get green, it's also a solution to every country's problem. You know, you're, you're in the middle of Africa with a waterfall and no industry. What's your best, how are you going to lift your people out of poverty? <laughs> well, you plug, you know, a turbine into your waterfall, you plug Bitcoin mining into the turbine, and now you have cheap, uh, cheap energy plug that's green, that's plugged into a clean, hard currency exporter that pays taxes that elevates you out of poverty that's environmentally friendly. So I, I think it's a good story here. People just don't, they don't understand, right, just how powerful Bitcoin is as a force for, for energy sustainability. Yeah. The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I want to take you through that will 100x your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like the the attacks upon it from an environmental standpoint are relentless. And to be honest, I just sort of brushed them off based on the facts that you've given. It seemed like, wait, people just don't understand the narrative or they don't understand the facts. They've fallen for a narrative. And until Elon Musk, who's sort of the king of clean energy, for the love of God, uh, came out and expressed concerns over the environmental impact of Bitcoin. Um, how is it possible if everything that you just said is true that somebody so into the world of clean energy could be against it i think we've got a lot of education to do I, the uh, the industry hasn't published um transparent statistics about the nature of the energy usage in bitcoin mining because the bitcoin miners are very decentralized and so and so um Encouraging transparency and gathering all the data and publishing it, that will be helpful because, because there's a good story here. I think that the, 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 the mining, uh, the energy usage is not well understood. For example, three years ago, someone thought that energy was used in transactions. And then they thought, since energy is used in transactions, if we scale up the number of transactions, eventually Bitcoin will boil the ocean. And uh, that wasn't true either, because the Bitcoin network never increases the number of transactions and the, and the energy usage is unrelated to transactions. And in fact, the energy usage is decreasing exponentially as, as the transactions scale in efficiency exponentially. But the model was flawed and so people picked it up and no one's published a better model. So, so we need to, and if you only spend an hour thinking about it or spend a few hours, you might not understand the nuances. So I think that the industry needs to do a better job of transparently communicating the current usage of energy and transparently communicating how it's going to change over the next 20 years. Have you read Matt Ridley's book, The Evolution of Everything? No, I haven't. It's really interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with him as an author, uh, but he wrote a book called The Rational Optimist. Another really great book. He's written a few. I think he also was the one that wrote The Red Queen, which is basically evolution is about running as fast as you can to effectively stay in place. And in the book, he he goes into why the basically you have two ways to look at the world. You have a, a creationist point of view where it's like a top down. God created the, the universe, you know, let there be light and everything went into motion. And so, hey, top down, that works. And then you've got an evolutionary lens where everything is bottom up. And he goes and makes a very credible case why a lot of the things that we think of as being um, top down were really bottom up. And I've heard you talk a lot about in drawing parallels to Bitcoin, you've talked a lot about like, hey, if you look at any city that's you know a couple hundred years old, the buildings are all six stories tall. And they're six stories tall because that's what masonry and a wood frame is gonna get you. And people without electricity are not going to be able to go up more than six flights of stairs. And so you hypothesize that, hey, if you went and looked at Rome, my guess is that in Rome, they're probably going to be six feet tall. There's just a, a materials problem. And so you end up getting skyscrapers the way that we think of them now as 
the steel comes along and now steel can build bigger buildings. You've got electricity so you can do an elevator. And so steel wasn't this moment of, or skyscraper is not a moment of pure genius by an architect. It's the ground up of like, oh, look, steel becomes a thing. Electricity becomes a thing. Architects are learning something. And so this one thing is probably more a reflection of its time than it is this staggering genius where somebody lurches us forward. And so he looks at all these classic cases where we thought it was one person that really did this thing. Like there's something like seven people uh, in different countries that came up with a light bulb at almost exactly the same time. And so in the West, we of course hear about Thomas Edison, but in reality, he's saying, no, 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 this was just an idea whose time had come. And it really gave me a very visceral understanding of the difference between somebody that just the subroutine running in the back of their mind is creationist in origin, that I view everything through the lens of uh, a particular genius sparks and then something moves forward versus all the things you mistake for that, including the universe itself is actually a bottom up phenomenon. And once you flip your thinking over to everything evolves, everything comes from the bottom up, you begin to come up with solutions that are more effective, right? And so going back to the old adage, I forget who it was that came, Yeltsin maybe, that came from Russia and was doing a tour of a grocery store. And he just could not believe like the shelves are all full. And he's like, but who decides the price of bread? And they're like, what do you mean? Like, it's just set locally at the local store. And that is top-down thinking where it's so embedded into your psyche, you can't even conceive of another way to do it versus us where, you know, we wouldn't think to have somebody tell us. It's like, well, you just set the price based on what somebody can control there. But I feel as somebody who's just old enough to, you know, I was a kid when Reagan was president and now I can feel everything shifting in the opposite direction, which brings me to the question I really want to ask you point blank. What, what do you think it, uh, so I'll, I'll lead you down a garden path. I think the problem is that the reality of the market is it leaves some people behind. Some businesses collapse and that's painful. Some people will lose their generation's worth of wealth in a bad decision. And if you're not willing to let some people uh, get eaten by the lion, you got to go top down. The problem is you then crush them. You, you cuddle them to death. What's your thought on that? I, I think that if you're an individual looking for the rational path forward, what you want to do is embrace technologies or ideologies that, um, that uh, reinforce individual sovereignty and freedom and, uh, and they're rational. So, so hence Bitcoin, right? Like if you're going to, if you have um, a bunch of money and you have a choice, are you going to buy a million dollars of gold and put it in a bank of a centralized institution that will seize it? Are you going to buy a million dollars of land in the middle of Beijing where the government of China could just take it from you? Are you going to buy a million dollars worth of a stock in a Chinese company? How about an American company? How about an Argentinian company? Or are you going to buy a million dollars worth of a crypto asset that's in cyberspace beyond the reach of a government or a corporation? And so clearly, that, I mean, the answer is, if you take all of your money and all of your power and you put it in the middle of Beijing, right, they own you. And what, if, you're, if your life is not consistent with the policies of that government, then you lose everything. When you put, if you took all your money and you you invested it in New York City, the mayor of New York could just take it. And if if New York, you know, if you took all your money and you put it in New Zealand and New Zealand locked down the economy for a year, right? Then they own you. So, so if you're looking for sovereignty and freedom or ra a rational path forward where you get a choice then you need to actually put your property beyond the reach of a government that might be irrational or uh, that might be capricious. And you need to put it beyond the reach of a corporation that might be influenced by said government. Do you think though, even with Bitcoin, so as I, as I run this experiment in my own mind, 
I always come down to, but the government could still say, if you own Bitcoin, you're going to pay this tax. And at that point, I just have to leave the fucking country. I mean, that seems like the only solution. Like this ultimately does come down to any government could act however they want. They can put whatever mandate on you they want. And I think part of where people's, the average person's willingness to adopt Bitcoin comes down to that thought of like, Jesus, man, if the government is coming after me and they could, do I really want to flee? Like, so I think- Well, like, let's come back to that. So let's say that, that let's make this easier. What if you were in Zimbabwe right now and you had a million dollars? Well, it's easy for me as an American to be like, yeah, of course I'd flee Zimbabwe. Well, but let me when turn I, around. Why don't, why don't you just go? It doesn't matter. You're not going to want to flee. Why don't you just go ahead and invest it in the town square in the middle of a village in Zimbabwe? I mean, the point because is- Because that definitely does feel riskier. I'm now, I'm, you know, gluing something down. So I'll give you, even in my own life, in fact, I'll oh, make like, this- Why don't we just, why don't we sink you up to your knees in concrete in the town square in Zimbabwe? I mean, while we're on that subject. The point really is, is you have a physical presence in this world. And so ultimately, maybe they won't let you out through the airport. Right. What if I just tell you I'm going to murder you next Monday? Will you leave? Will you stay? Right. Maybe you can't leave. Right. But the point is, is um, there are a whole set of decisions you can make in life where you don't have the choice. If you make the decision to invest your family's life savings in a building in a country in Africa run by a dictator, you have given up the option to live in Europe. You've given up the option to leave. You've given up the option to do anything. So the question really is, do you want the option or do you want to give up the option? Because one is a choice of death. The other is a choice of life. There is no guarantee. If you leave Africa and come to the US, it seems like it's pretty obvious to me. Like The truth is everybody in the world would leave a weak country and come to a strong country. Everybody. That's why we have a, a border issue, right? Everybody wants to be in America. So that's not a hard sell. If you come back to the issue of, well, I'm an entitled American, will I ever want to leave America? Maybe you won't. But the point there is, if you had a choice between being rich and living in Texas or being destitute and living in California, would you cling to California and be destitute? Or would you be rich and live in Texas? Because that doesn't seem so controversial either. It seems pretty obvious that if you can go to one state where you can live happily, what if I told you you're going to be locked in your bedroom for the next decade if you live in one state and you're going to starve to death, or you can move to another state and you can live a normal life? Mm. You're like, well, what, isn't it obvious that you would like the option to live in the place that will allow you to breathe the air freely and conduct your business? Right. When, when one place says you can't sit at dinner with your family and the other place says you can have dinner with your family, you're going to want to leave from point A to point B. So you won't be able to do it if your property is fixed. Right. The, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of Jews died in Nazi Germany in the 30s because their property was fixed in Germany. They didn't want to leave and they got trapped there. If their property had been in a crypto asset like Bitcoin and they could have left, they'd be alive. And, and uh, it's not that hard to make that point. And you can, you, can, you can illustrate that with every expatriate and every immigrant uh, fleeing you know, every war zone. Just go to go, go, ask the Cubans, right, that fled Cuba and came to Florida you know, after Castro came to power about what they lost and how they feel about it. So my point really is you can't fix the political problem in a country. Like Zimbabwe has been getting squeezed progressively for the past 50 years. And Cuba is the same way. You might not be able to change an entire regime, but you do have a choice as to whether or not you will, uh, you will commit yourself or allow yourself to be owned by the regime. And when you actually choose to put money, like for example, when you choose to save your money in the peso, you accept the inflation of the peso. Would you take all your money right now, sell the dollars and go buy uh, Zimbabwe currency? Would you do that? 
Probably not, right? It seemed seem pretty foolish. Would you take everything you own? Would you take your family and would you ship them to a hostile nation? Would you move everybody to North Korea? No, probably not. But I mean, it's it's such a silly observation. It's, it it kind of illustrates the point, right? No Which doubt. Is, you have a choice as to where you put yourself physically. And maybe you've decided physically the safest place is the U.S. Now you got to choose the state. Now you got to choose the city. Now you got to choose the house. You also have a choice at the, of, as to where you put yourself economically, your wealth, your balance sheet. If you choose the dollar, you're losing 7 to 20% a year. If you lose the peso, you're losing 50% a year. If you choose the bolivar, you're losing 95% of it a year. You have that choice. And third, you have a choice as to where you put your livelihood. You can choose to work as a YouTube streamer. You know what? You depend upon YouTube. If you say something that causes YouTube to rip your channel off, your livelihood goes to zero. So if you choose to make your livelihood on YouTube, you should pay attention to their policies and act accordingly. If your livelihood is a hot dog stand in Beijing, act ac- if your livelihood is in Moscow downtown, downtown, think about the Russian policy, you act accordingly. Everybody has a choice as to where they will place their livelihood, what corporation they'll be dependent upon, what regulator they will be dependent upon, what government they will be dependent upon, right? You have a lot of choices today. Just be rational. You, I can't fix you know, all of these problems in the world. All I can do is say some places are more permissive than others. On the margin, I would guess that your odds of being able to operate your business in in the face of a potential pandemic are higher in Texas than they are in certain left-leaning states. On the margin, Florida, probably higher. If the, if the governor says, I'm never going to shut down a business, you have a right to work, probably you have a higher right there. So you get to choose, but that changes every month and every year, right? So public policy is changing. Economic policy is changing. One thing is clear, though. If you put your money in gold, it'll probably be seized by the by the counterparty. And if it isn't seized, you're going to lose half of it every 30 years. If you put your money in a currency, you're going to lose half of it every five to 10 years. If you put your money into a weak currency, you lose half of it every five to 10 months. If you put your money into an equity, you're going to have to trust the management team, but the management team is going to dilute you in their in their pursuit of their plans and strategies. And if the equity is valued on cash flows, what if I gave you the most profitable company in Zimbabwe right now? Like, how much is the equity worth over the next decade? What are the cash flows worth for a company that generates Zimbabwe dollars for the next decade if the dollar crashes in Zimbabwe? So. You have to be aware that you are trusting your balance sheet to some macroeconomic force, and and you're putting yourself in that frame of reference. You're trusting your P&L to a different set of macroeconomic forces, right? You're a Chinese company, and you do work in China, and you sell food in China, but you save in the U.S. dollar, you see? You have dollar exposure, and then you have Chinese... Chinese commercial exposure. When you're a Saudi Arabian oil company, you have you're selling uh, oil, and so y- you have that business energy exposure. But then you're saving in dollars. You have that exposure, and you can't easily move the oil fields out of the country you're in. So you have that political exposure. So ultimately, I think the lesson, I mean, the big idea of the last two years is. Every individual needs to become macroeconomically sophisticated and politically sophisticated. If you ran a yoga studio in New York and you didn't care about politics and you didn't care about macroeconomics and you thought you could ignore that and just study yoga, well, you had a rude awakening, right? Mm -hmm. When the mayor decides that it's illegal to sell yoga services, you know, in your studio, then, uh, then you realize that it probably matters what the politicians think. So I would say today, everybody needs to understand money because they need to understand how to protect their balance sheet. They need to understand property rights. You you may not have property. You don't have property rights in North Korea and Cuba. You can't own property. 
But if you happen to own a piece of property, you know, do you have property rights if you own a coal field? Maybe not. Maybe it's illegal to actually uh, mine for coal. Do you own natural gas rights? Maybe it's illegal to run a pipeline to your natural gas field. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do. Right. So you need to understand, do you have property and what is the exposure of the property politically to the jurisdiction where you have nexus? And uh, I want to start once you understand that you make a rational decision with your life and your family's future, decide where you'll locate your family, where you will locate your business, where you will locate your balance sheet. And then you probably want to pick up the paper and read the news because you can have regime change. Right. If the if the governor of a certain state says, I disagree 180 degrees with the former governor and I'm going to pursue the opposite strategy. Mm. How long is that governor going to be in power and how much power do they have? And at some point, the federal government may override the state government. Right. I mean, the federal government will act in certain jurisdictions. It doesn't matter what the governor thinks about maybe drilling for for gas on on land. Maybe it matters. Like the governor can't mandate a nuclear power plant if the federal government says you can't have one. So you need to be aware of of how all these things interact as you make a decision about your life. All right. I want to sum up uh, what you've been saying in slightly different words and tell me if I'm understanding all of this, because every time I research you, every time I talk to you, I realize that. I feel like I understand everything you're saying. And then I'll spend, you know, eight more hours with you. And I learned that much. And, and then I learned this much more. And it really does impact how I view uh, Bitcoin for sure, money definitely. And then the idea that I think you're trying to get across between the words, which is um, sovereignty and mobility. So for the first time in my life, I feel like we're entering a period of uh, political volatility that finally has me going. I don't like the idea of being grounded in any one area by the things that I own. So I'm in the process now of selling uh, my homes. And I never thought that I would get there, but I happen to be in California where they take a very aggressive posture. Uh, And so that clicked over for me. Now, hearing you talk just now, the ability to get my, because right now, uh, a significant portion of my net worth is tied up in real estate. And that was me growing up. That's where you wanted your money. So that was just like a a sort of default response. So tied up in real estate, but to your point, I can't move those, the blocks of Los Angeles to somewhere with more favorable um, let's say entrepreneurial leanings. So I'm, I have a, a real grounding here, certainly with that money, but I could put that money in a form. So one, I want to remind everybody what we said at the beginning. So money is you transferring your, your time, your energy, but also your efficiency, your intelli- intelligence into a thing. That thing could be money. Or in this case, I have a lot of, for me, a lot of that tied up into physical property. And so, okay. We cool, monetized t- real estate. We monetize real estate when we devalue the currency. And so your property becomes your store of value money. Right. Which getting everybody to understand that the more knowledgeable somebody is about money, the more they are constantly looking for, where can I put this money that it will stay? It will retain the purchasing power that it has or that its purchasing power will go up. Now, I live 40 years of my life without ever asking that question because all I ever thought about was generate money whether that was generate a paycheck or whether that was build equity in the company that I would ultimately sell. But once I mm. sold a company and all of a sudden had you know a very substantial amount of money, all of a sudden I had to understand investing. It was a real shock to my system. So just understanding that you're putting your money into something that you hope will retain its value or grow its value over time, but there are massive complexities. So if you're living in a house and you're thinking that it's doing that, you're actually paying a lot more money for that privilege than you think. So that's certainly something to contemplate. But anyway, by looking at where else I could put it, you start asking a series of very interesting questions. Now, one of the more interesting collisions with you that I think is between you and Peter Schiff, but not as Peter Schiff relates to gold, because as you very aptly pointed out, he owns like 5% of his portfolios in gold. He obviously doesn't have a real big belief in that. 
And the parts that he does have in gold, he has in gold miners who are actively shorting gold. Cool. Right. But what I think he represents, and Jesus, I'm speaking for somebody I've never met or spoken to, but what I think he represents is, um, we'll call it something more like Ray Dalio's idea of diversification based on like what's happening. And he's got the idea of an all weather portfolio. So it seems like the what you represent to me is somebody who has tremendous conviction, possibly a lot of risk tolerance, which is something that I want to better understand about you. And everybody else, myself included, is more like, ah, I'm not sure. I don't know. So I have what many would consider an irresponsible <laughs> amount, of, amount of my net worth in Bitcoin. Um, but I put in as much as I was willing to lose. And so, but I, I put in over about a year, I dollar cost averaged in over a year and then <clears> said, <throat> cool, that's all that I'm going to do. So even though the price has gone down, I'm not buying more as of right now. I just want to make the point, like, I, I think the real issue here is, do you have an engineering mentality and reason from first principles, or are you, are you simply um, complying with the norms of society and conventional wisdom that you grew up with? People say things, and they repeat these bromides, and... And they give you a simple rule of thumb, like, oh, the rule of thumb is 60-40 stock bond portfolio, or the rule of thumb is <clears throat> stay diversified, you know, or the rule of thumb is, you know, uh, you know, uh, take, uh, buy the biggest house you can and get the biggest mortgage and you'll be fine. Okay. Well, those are all fine assuming that you have equilibrium and you and, and you don't have uh, um, a radical state change for example that that all those rules of thumb don't they don't work if you're a Jew in Nazi Germany in the 30s right buying a house to store value doesn't work right trusting the government how about trust the government keep your nose clean that doesn't work right buying stocks stocks that's an interesting thing in the U.S. when the money supply expands at 7% a year. Do you think stocks work if you bought stocks in Zimbabwe or stocks in Cuba or stocks in North Korea or stocks in Argentina or stocks fill in the blank? They don't work. What happens when the government crashes? You think stocks work in Sri Lanka? Right? No. How do stocks work in Russia in the 90s? Well, the entire currency collapsed, the government collapsed, everybody lost everything, everything. So, you know, diversification. Diversification doesn't work when every single thing you own in your portfolio is correlated. For example, you can buy any company, you can buy any company you want in, in uh, Germany in 1944. How's your diversification gonna work, right? How about just be, how about buy anything you want in the city I'm about to drop a nuclear bomb on? How's that going to work, right? So diversification is a bromide. Uh, stocks, bonds are a bromide. Uh, real estate as monetizable property, it's a bromide. It only works if you can trust them. What, how's it going to work when I actually get elected mayor and I just seize your entire property to make into a pet hospital for the good of the people? Or how about this one? At what property tax rate? If property tax are, tw are, are 20 basis points a year, maybe property is money. What happens when they're 200 basis points a year? Property tax rate in Florida is 2% a year. Okay, if, if, you're not a, if you don't have the homestead exemption and you're not a citizen, then that means you buy $10 million worth of property, you pay $200,000 of tax, then they actually assess it up 15% a year. So that means that in 10 years, the property is valued at $30 million. You owe $600,000 in tax. In the next five years, you've lost all your money. Okay, but I thought Florida was low tax state. Huh? I thought property was a good investment. Well, let's make it simpler. What if I make the tax rate 5% a year? What if I make it 50% a year? Like, what if, you know, so the point really is, all of these are simple rules of thumb that allow people to not think for themselves. You know, uh, 
you're on a ship. The ship is sinking. There's 10 boats in front of you. One of the boats doesn't have a hole in it. The other three, nine boats have holes in them. You're going to put, you got 10 members in your family. Are you going to put one kid in each of the nine boats or, or the like, or are you going to put everybody in the boat that doesn't have the hole in it? Okay. So you come to that level of conviction, which is intoxicating, by the way. It's not conviction. It's like, it's not conviction. It's just rational thinking for yourself. Are you moving your entire family to Zimbabwe right now? Because, you know, you have conviction or let me reverse it. Why is it that you don't move your entire family to Zimbabwe, sell all your stuff and buy the Zimbabwe dollar? Why is it that you don't do that? Because, because of conviction or just because it seems quite obvious to you, that's not a good idea. I won't say that conviction is the when you don't do something, but when you go all in on something, I would say that does take conviction. Now, your conviction how, might how be- How many chairs are you principles. sitting on right now? One. Are you all in on the chair? I am all in on the chair. Like, like the, the point really is you put on one pair of glasses, you've got one pair of-, of AirPods right now. You're looking at me through one screen. You're using one microphone. That's a one microphone. Like you trust it? Is that conviction? Seems kind of scary. Why don't you diversify? Why don't you use 10 microphones? The point really is things in your life. Do you drive in 10 cars at the same time or one car at one time? Do you drive down one street? Aren't you afraid that you're driving down one street? Do you take a different way? You know? Uh, so my point really is if you're an engine, you get a one airplane, are you convicted? You put your entire family in the one airplane. Aren't you afraid? Ultimately, if you're a rational individual, do you use, when you use knives, do you have copper knives, wooden knives, steel knives, aluminum knives, rubber band knives, diamond knives, because you're afraid to commit to the right knife? It's a, it's a tool. So ultimately what I'm saying here is an engineer would look at this and say, I use glass for my windows. I don't use aluminum for my windows. because I can't see through the aluminum, right? I use steel beams. People used to use wooden beams. Steel beams work better, right? I use copper for wires because electricity goes through copper better. I don't use aluminum for wires. Right? Am I am I a radical, convicted, fanatic investor? Or am I just like a rational person that uses copper for wires because copper works better? Right. And my point here is you live in a society and things are going awry. If 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 you did live in a country and the food supply was cut off, the electricity got turned off, the currency collapsed, and there are riots in the streets, would you still just kind of hang out and use the same rules of thumb you've been using? Or or would you say, I think I'm going to exit via the airport where there are no riots if I can get on that plane and I'm going to go somewhere else? Because not because I'm convicted, not because I'm radical, not because I'm a risk taker. No, I'm just going to do it because I'm an intelligent human being. And I notice that it's getting uncomfortable where I am right now. And so that's the way I see this. It is it is utter it's just thinking for yourself using reason. Your choice is you want to hold a billion dollars of property in Zimbabwe or North Korea. You want to hold a billion dollars of property in LA. You want to hold a billion dollars of gold in a vault. You want to hold a billion dollars worth of a stock in a Chinese company, Alibaba, trading on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, subject to the Chinese government. Do you want to hold a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin? What do you want to hold? Right? Why do you why do you feel that way? Once you understand money, you understand Bitcoin is is engineered money and it's engineered without defects. Once you look at your life, you realize you got a balance sheet. You got to actually allocate your your wealth to portions of the balance sheet and assumptions you used to be able to make about bonds, they don't work anymore. Assumptions you used to make about stocks, they don't work anymore. Assumptions you made about property. You own a yoga studio. I get elected mayor and I tell you point blank, I think yoga is dangerous. People should not be able to do yoga. It's abomination in the eyes of God for the next decade. 
you still have the same view of your value of your yoga studio? You know, are you going to say, maybe I can repurpose it to something that's uh, politically correct? Or you say, maybe I'm just going to like sell it and go someplace where I'm less likely to get canceled, right? As a business, this is, this is not radical conviction, right? The people that, you know, we, we like to think the people that came to the United States were crazy, but, but they're not crazy. The reason they came to the U.S. is because they were the wrong religion or the wrong ethnic group in a country that had uh, an encroaching authoritarian government. And at some point, the Catholics decided the Protestants aren't allowed to own property or live. And at some point, the Protestants decided Catholics, they can't own property. <laughs> and if it turns out that you happen to be a Catholic, you're going to be drawn and quartered, right? And the skin will be flayed off your skin. You know, my family came from Lucerne, Switzerland in 1730, and they were Palatines. They were Swiss Protestants. Okay, why would you get on a wooden ship, travel for 12 weeks, risk 5% chance of death to get out of your hometown? And the answer is because it was a certain death, a certain slow death if I stuck around. And that is, that is the story of America for hundreds of years. Quakers, Protestants, Catholics, you know, men and knights, name it. Every sect was leaving and immigrating because the life was hopeless where they stayed. And I don't know, I call that radical conviction as much as I would just say, at some point they realized that it was riskier to stand where they are than it is to move somewhere else. And if I, if I look at Bitcoin, I, I, I'm not going to say, well, let me say it this way. If you're in a city in the middle of Africa taken over by a dictator who's going to murder everybody next Tuesday, I would say convert all your wealth to Bitcoin and leave. Okay? If you happen to live in Florida or Texas and you've got a comfortable life and family and you expect to be there for the next 30 years and you want to own some land, a building, you know, a restaurant and some Bitcoin, I say, okay, a diversified portfolio, I guess that's fine for you. And if you're somewhere else where, you know, if you're sitting in a country where the bank is about to freeze your assets and devalue them 10 to 1 and trickle them back to you over the next 20 years, I would say on the margin, yeah, you probably should convert them all to Bitcoin and get them out of uh, a custodian because, because the volatility of Bitcoin and the risk of Bitcoin is a lot less than the risk of trusting the bank and trusting the government and trusting the local currency. So ultimately, everyone's got to decide just how risky is their macroeconomic situation. And if you happen to be wealthy living in Manhattan and you're living off a trust fund, you might not have a problem. You might think it's okay. But, you know, ask people that fled Cuba or North Korea how okay it was, right? There's uh, Everybody's got to make their decision. The lucky thing is you have an option. Today, you have an option. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you didn't have an option to move all of your wealth onto a crypto asset network. And what Bitcoin represents is hope. It's, ho it's hope for a refugee that's going to flee a hostile regime, a hostile banking system, a hostile environment. And, and uh, if you're one of the three or four billion people that has no hope otherwise, then for you, it's really a egalitarian, you know, utilitarian entitlement. For people that are rich in the Western world, it's just an investment option for them until they get sensitized to this issue. And the more you get sensitized, then you believe that then you start to realize that it's an it's a moral imperative, even if not for you, maybe you're rich and safe. It's a moral imperative for you to support it. For them, for the, for people that are in Africa or South America or, or fleeing from a war zone or fleeing from a hostile regime that's going to confiscate 20, 30, 40 percent of their property every year forever. So even if you don't think you need it in order to protect your family for the next 30 years, seems to me like you might want to support it just because it's the right thing for humanity. And that's where I come down on this situation. COVID hits and I'm like, whoa, the monetary system is blowing up. I'm super 
scared for other people that the basically they have no sense of how to invest or if inflation is going to go crazy, like how to protect against that. And so I start bringing on financial experts and none of them could talk at the street level about like, what does the guy do that's making $52,000 a year? What does that guy do? And none of them had an answer. And then I come across you and you've got this idea that we're having a once in a thousand year opportunity with Bitcoin. And I'm like, I've got to get people to understand how you have come to that, how you have come to that conclusion through first principles. And then like we can get to sort of the, what they should do. So walk through how you go from that sort of early tweet that you just sent off as a whatever saying, you know, Bitcoin is never going to be anything to like, whoa, this is real. And as a person and as the CEO of a company, I'm going all in. How does that change happen? Well, the, the catalytic event is uh, the pandemic and the events that took place in March of 2020. And what you saw was Main Street shut down. It literally shut down and came to a grinding halt. And Wall Street had an initial panic and a rapid recovery, a V-shaped recovery. And so we put those two together. You had an L-shaped recovery. Main Street just shut down. <laughs> and then you had a V-shaped recovery, and we call that a K. But, what we, but if you decompose it, and I, and I was very sensitive to it because on one hand, in my personal life, I'm an investor. And in my public life, I run a, a, a Main Street company. I, I run a software company that has people that, that manufactures software that does things. So um, what I saw was if you, had, um, if you had a large portfolio of stocks or assets and you went into this pandemic, uh, after the Fed uh, ended up expanding the money supply uh, with the interest rates going to zero and the expansion of the M2 monetary base, the money base, you found that you were actually 25, 30 percent wealthy or doing nothing. You could have done nothing the entire year, as long as right, the only mistake you could have made is do something, right? If you if you had a billion dollars and you did nothing for the entire year, you had one point three billion dollars at the end of the year. On the other hand, if you had a Main Street company and you're generating, let's say, a hundred million dollars a year in cash flow and you're valued at a billion because of the cash flow, you would have to be generating 130 million after a year to be valued the same because the value, uh, the assets that the money buy is, is being devalued by 30%. If the currency is devalued at some rate and you know the money supply expanded to 24% last year, so you could use that as your metric or you could use the S&P 500's return as another metric, but clearly, uh, the currency devalued, which means that if you're a Main Street company, you had to work 20 percent harder to get nothing. And if you're a Wall Street company, you had to work, you had to do nothing to get 20 percent better. And so what I saw was a shift in balance of power, you know, and a shift in, in wealth. And it was pretty disturbing to me, too. You know, it's like. You don't want to be uh, the dentist working for a fixed amount of money that's getting 20 percent less valuable every year. So the average person, I think, struggles with that because they're like, well, I'm getting my stimulus check. What do you mean? Like, how is this going down? Cost of bread's the cost of bread. I'm all good. I, I think there are some fundamental uh, misnomers or 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 um, understandings of the world that people miss and what and the most pernicious one is the idea that inflation equals CPI, which is consumer price index, average shit. The idea that there is a number that for inflation, inflation is only 2% or inflation is 1% or inflation might be 3%. Okay, that's just a mistaken idea. Um, to, to What is inflation? Inflation is the rate at which the things you want to buy are going up in price. And what are the things you want to buy? Well, you might want to buy pizza, you want, might want to buy Netflix, but you might want to buy a house. You might want to rent a house, but if you want to rent a house, it might not go up in price as much as if you want to buy a house. What if you want to buy a house in the middle of Manhattan? It might go up in price differently than a house in the middle of Kansas. What if I want to buy food? What if I want to buy energy? What if I want to buy a Picasso? Or what if I want to buy something truly scarce? What if I want season tickets to you know the baseball game? 
What if I want health care? What if I want early retirement? They're all things you can buy. You can buy assets. You can buy um, luxury service. You, you want to buy a Rolex? You want to buy a Maserati or a Porsche luxury goods? Or do you want to buy commodity goods? And there are some things you don't have to pay for, right? They're ad finance, right? Streaming YouTube. What's that? What's the inflation rate on streaming YouTube ad finance, right? So the inflation is, is the cost of stuff. If the money um, supply is expanding, that means the currency is devaluing. Um, uh, in a closed system, if we want to make that simple, I live in a town and there's a thousand houses and I, and I double the amount of currency in the town and everybody wants a house, what's the price of houses do, right? If, if the only thing I can buy is a house and if I double the amount of currency, then the price of the house must go up. Probably go up by two, but, but maybe not exactly by two, but it goes up. If I increase the amount of money, if I, get, if I raise everybody's salary by a factor of 10 and I keep the number of houses constant, one might presume that the price of houses will go up. How will inflation actually take place? Well, there's a different coefficient uh, for price uh, for the price gradient or the change in price for everything you might want to buy, and it's different at every point in time. So, for example, if I put you in lockdown and I make it illegal to go to the movies and I make it illegal to go to a restaurant, then the price of restaurants and movie theaters aren't going to go up. If I if I make it illegal to or, or inappropriate to go on a cruise and fly in an airplane, then the price of cruise tickets and movie theater tickets and restaurants, they just don't go up because you can't buy them if you want to. There's no velocity on that money. Okay, what can you buy? You can buy stocks. You can buy crypto, right? So what, you know, what does go up? Well, if I give you $1,000 and you can go and you can buy stocks, then the price of stocks go up. Now, what happens, um, what happens next? Well, so everybody gets locked into their um, apartment and they decide they really want a house with grass. So what happened next? Well, 12 weeks after the lockdowns, the price of like suburban housing went up and people started trying to buy houses. They said, this is unprecedented. We've never had so much demand for houses in the suburbs of New York. Well, that's not a surprise. You know what, if, you, if your choices, if I closed the parks in the cities and you know, and, and I close your office, then why wouldn't you move out into the country and live at a house with green grass, right? You're not, the utility, you're not missing out on a restaurant, you're not missing out on a park, you're not missing out on your job. So rational human behavior causes people to take their money and go buy things they want. So, and where do they buy them? Well, um, you know, Hamptons real estate went up in, in price 50%. Palm Beach, they go to the places where they want to go uh, did the price of land in the middle of North Dakota go up by 50%? Not so much. It's not, you know, it's not a scarce, desirable asset by people stampeding. So, um, so what is inflation? Inflation is a vector. It's not a scalar. A vector means you can calculate for a thousand different products, a thousand different numbers, and they change every month. So I could give you a thousand different numbers uh, 12 different times a year, and it would be different in every city. Everybody can figure out that in Minot, North Dakota, it's different than Manhattan. And it's even different in Manhattan than in Brooklyn, and it's different in Brooklyn than in upstate New York. So inflation is varying by time, by space, and it's varying by every item. And if you want to calculate the inflation index, you have to construct a market basket of goods and services and assets that you would want to acquire. And then I can give you the rate at which that market basket of goods and services and assets is changing every month or every week. Um, and uh, of course, that would be different for every person. So what happened after the lockdowns? Well, we got hyperinflation in some things, bonds hyperinflated cost of bonds doubled in three weeks. Whoa. That's hyperinflation. Uh, equities inflated, you know, they were up 40%, you know, year over year. Uh, you know, cryptos inflated, Bitcoin was up three, 400%. So the cost of scarce art, the, the cost of luxury real estate, 
all of that stuff inflated, you know, or hyperinflated. What didn't inflate? Things that people can't buy. <laughs> and and yeah, I can define a market. I could define a market basket of things that don't go up in price by definition too. Right. If I define a market basket of highly manufactured goods that have very low variable cost, right? Like what's the price of your streaming YouTube video or what's the price of some manufactured box of macaroni that's 5% food and 95% marketing, <laughs> right? I mean, the more man, if I spent $2 billion on a fa on a factory to stamp out widgets that have a variable cost of 10%, Right, then inflate. Then I've already sunk the cost in the factory. Those things don't inflate at the same rate as, you know, if there's only one Mona Lisa in the world, and if I increase the amount of money in the world by a factor of a hundred, don't you think that the value of the Mona Lisa would go up, assuming that lots of wealthy people wanted it? And that that gets you to the really the the interesting theory of economics, right? If I want to really understand the, anything in the engineering world, I need to use vector, vector calculus, right, <laughs> or vector math. I would never use arithmetic. You, you cannot solve the problem of fluid dynamics with arithmetic. You can't design a boat. You can't design a plane. You can't design a nuclear reactor. And you can't design a bridge with arithmetic. Well, a scalar, like, oh, inflation is 2%, that's arithmetic, right? You know, adding it up, right? Uh, Isaac Newton gave us the calculus of variations, you know, and calculus in general, and pretty much every sophisticated thing that flies or floats, you know, it's all based upon calculus, and uh, and uh, you just can't solve the problem without that math. So that's the problem with inflation. What is up, my friend? Tom Bill, you here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10? If your answer is anything less than a 10, I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called how to build ironclad discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. Okay, so let's, inflation is our problem but we have the confounding variable of the average person is being told by sort of the mainstream media, by the government, hey, inflation's not a problem. They look at their basket of Netflix and bread and whatever, and it all seems fine. They're getting their stimulus check, there's no worry. But the reality of inflation is completely different, and we're now seeing a break in the narrative from the government saying, well, actually, inflation is, you know, whatever, twice what we thought it was, and that may be just the tip of an iceberg that's coming. So inflation is a problem in, in two ways. One, if you pour money into the system, inflation is going to go up on a certain set of items. And then number two, if you're confused about what inflation is, because it is not simple arithmetic, you're now paralyzed, especially when that's confounded by marketing, essentially. So cool. So we've got inflation is sort of problem number one. You're, you often use the analogy of, you know, if you have a boat that has a leak in it, you've got a real problem. And if you know that inflation at some level exists, you've already got a problem. So when did you begin to think, okay, I've got this. In fact, what I'm really, the, the part that I find so intriguing about your story is when you turn to Wall Street and we're like, I have a profitable company. It is wildly profitable. And yet Wall Street does not like it. Dear Wall Street, why do you not like my company? And the answer to this is so revealing. Yeah, the company was valued at like one times revenue plus uh, cash. And uh, I said, well, I have, I have 500 million in cash. Why don't we get more credit? And the answer is cash is trash. <laughs> like it's Ray Dalio's quote, cash is trash. Well, why is cash trash? 
Well, if the money supply is expanding at 7% a year, then the, then the risk-free hurdle rate is 7%. If you don't generate more than 7% yield on your cash, then it's devaluing. So from 2010 to 2020, the money supply expanded at 7%. So all the cash you're holding is losing 7% of its value. Um, assume you have a 0% interest rate or zero yield on the cash. So you can imagine the traditional world, you invest your cash at 3% treasury yields and you get a minus 7 and it's like a minus 4% and divide 4 into 72. And, you know, and somewhere 15, 20 years out, you're going to lose half of the shareholder value in the treasury. If you do that, people might hold their nose. But after March of 2000, the money supply is expanding at 24%, the interest rate zero. So now you have to put a forecast in place. At what rate will the, the money supply expand? If it expands at 20% a year and you're going to generate zero in treasury yield, then you're looking at cutting your treasury purchasing power in half in three and a half years. Whoa. Okay, now that's not trivial. So you have to find a way if you're going to, if you're going to have assets to get over the hurdle rate. Another way to say it is, I have to invest it in a strategy which is going to appreciate faster than the money uh, is devalued. If the money is devalued at, at 7% a year, then the S&P 500 index better yield 9 or 10%. If it yields 10% and the money devalues at 7%, you're plus 3. You can save money in an S&P 500 index fund. You can't save money with bonds unless... Unless you're buying bonds and the interest rates keep getting uh, reduced. If you, if you bought a bond at 4% yield and the interest rate got taken down to 3.5, the bond uh, trades up. And when the interest rate goes down to 3, it trades up again. And when it goes down to 2.5, it trades up again. When the bond rates get, or the LIBOR, uh, you know, the short-term bond uh, rate and interest rate goes to zero, you can't take it down anymore. So bonds won't hold value either. So now you're in a conundrum. I have a lot of assets, but I'm not beating the hurdle rate, and the hurdle just tripled. This is the problem that a company that's cash rich uh, has, and it's, a, and it's a problem that anybody that works for a salary has, which is I generate a cash, and the, ca the currency is being devalued uh, every year. The real question is what's the rate at which it's devalued? And... And that, let's do the thought experiment. What if, uh, what if we didn't print any more money? What if the inflation rate, uh, the monetary inflation rate, not the CPI, but what if the money expansion rate was zero? In that case, uh, the currency is also an asset and it's a store of value and, and a medium of exchange at the same time. That's a complete uh, Austrian economics, like deflationary uh, economy, where we have, call it hard money or sound money. The closest thing to that would be the gold standard. If the government said you can exchange your money for gold at any time and we'll keep gold equal to the amount of money and we won't print any more money, well, that puts you on a hard money standard. In that case, you could just store your money in a bank and it would be more valuable in the future, not less valuable. Um, when uh, the government goes off the gold standard, and we went off the gold standard explicitly in 1971, now the currency is losing some percent of its purchasing power every year because it's being inflated away. And what's the number? Well, it was about 7% a year, and now it's like 20% a year, and it's 15 to 20% a year, you know, and you, you got to figure out, is it 15, 20, or 25? But if it's 15 to 20, the currency is weakening 1% to 2% a month. When it gets to be 40 to 50, it's collapsing. That's Argentina or worse. So you've either got a country where the currency is weakening or a country where the, the currency is collapsing. When that happens, now you have a decomposition. The money is broken into two components. You have a currency component, which you use as a legal medium of exchange, like the dollar or the euro or the yen or the renminbi. Um, and then you have an asset component, which you use as a store of value over the, over the long term. Money uh, or U.S. dollars have ceased to be a store of value for at least the past decade since the great financial crisis. So what people did was they stampeded into ETFs and index funds, right? And, and to a certain extent, bonds. 
right? How do you store your value over the long term? Well, if I, if I take money and I buy a mixture of stocks and bonds, that will store my value because if, uh, if the economy is healthy, the, bonds, the stocks go up by 10% a year, the S&P does. And if the market, uh, the economy is not healthy, the Fed will lower the interest rates by 50 basis points and the bond will trade up. And so that works for how long? It works, watch the interest rates for the last decade. It works until you crank the interest rates down to zero. Mm. The, it used to be overnight money was 550 basis points, Tom, before the great financial crisis. And then they cranked it down from 550 to 500 to 450 to 400 to 350 to 300 to 250 to 200 to 150 to 100 to 50 to zero. And now we have, uh, you know, the bankers say, I'm not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. So that breaks bonds as a store of value unless you go negative interest rates. And uh, stocks, stocks work except for the fact that, you know, what stocks worked in the past decade? Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, a, a big tech company that grows 20% a year top line. When Apple stopped growing 20% a year top line, they fixed it by taking on massive amounts of debt, buying their stock back and leveraging up their EPS. So, so companies that grow faster than the rate of monetary inflation, faster than the 7%, they could hold value. A company growing 20% like Google, Facebook, or Amazon, they all hold value. In fact, they accrete value. Why? Because 20 is more than 7, <laughs> right? So it's, net, it's plus 13% a year, right? Um, what, ha what happens to all, those, all the other companies? Wh which companies in the S&P 500 amounted to all the indexes, or to all the gains? It was big tech, right? Big fang stocks were the winners. Everybody else treads water because if you're growing at 7% and the money supply is, is collapsing at 7%, you're net zero. And how else do you get around it? Well, you can go borrow a lot of money, leverage up, buy back half your stock and get your cash flow per share up. But what, what happens when you're fully leveraged, which is like where they are right now? You can't do it anymore. So what's the problem right now? The problem today is the currency is, is being devalued at 20% a year, not 7% a year, right? That's, I turned up the heat in the frying pan. And the second problem is some stocks could hope to grow 20% a year, like the minority, 5% of them could grow 20% a year for the past decade. What percentage of stocks can grow 30% a year? Because now you've got to grow 30 or 35% a year because the hurdle rate just jumped. Now you're pushed out on the risk on the risk uh, curve here. You got to take massive risk as a company to grow that fast. You got to do acquisitions. You got to you, you got to burn the candle on both ends. You got to take on massive new leverage. This is squeezing value stocks. Don't work, right? I mean, it squeezes you out of the value stock trade because the, if the company is reliable. And it's growing its cash flows 5% a year and the money supply is expanding at 20% a year. Cash is trash. Back to my story, right? Why is cash trash? Because I had a value stock with a lot of cash and the money supply is expanding. Look at it from the point of view of an investor. They can invest in the S&P 500 index or the NASDAQ and that those were all up like 40% year over year or something. <laughs> you know, or they could hold cash and get 0%. Nobody wants to hold cash. And so they might as well just take it and put it into something else. Now, long term, you can get a bump on equities uh, when you have a boost, when interest rates get spiked down. You saw it when we flood the market li with liquidity. Initially, that makes stocks go up. But um, let's take the example of uh, Zimbabwe and Argentina. If I keep doing it for 10 years, what happens to those stocks? They don't go up. Right. The problem over time is stocks are valued based upon the discounted value of the cash flows, or at least in part. And so if I give you a company generating 100 million in cash every year for the next decade, but I tell you there'll be 10 times as much money in the economy in a decade, that 100 million dollars of cash will only be worth 10, one tenth as much in a decade. Yeah. So you, the discount rate is jumping, which means the value of the cash flows into the future is collapsing. The road to serfdom, 
is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. And so how do you solve the problem? And the solution to the problem is you convert your assets from a weak currency that's inflating into a strong currency or a strong asset, if you will, that is deflating. Right. That, the, the simplest example is I'm a wealthy business person in Argentina and the peso is trading three to the dollar, three pesos to the dollar. And the year is 2003. And now I can go forward and I tell you, well, in the year 2020, the peso is going to trade 150 to the dollar on the on the blue market or the black market. That's going to be the real rate. So what's your best uh, strategy? Work hard. <laughs> invest it, diversify into other Argentine companies making pesos? No. Your best strategy is convert all your existing pesos into dollars and get it out of the country. And your next best strategy is forward finance your cash flows and convert those into dollars, get them out of the country. And your next strategy is sell equity in your ranch or your business in pesos in 2003 at three to one, three pesos to the dollar. And then buy dollars because the dollar is going to go up by a factor of 50. So what you're doing is you're financing in a weak currency and then you're converting into a strong currency. And that's pretty obvious if you lived in Zimbabwe or if you live Lebanon went from 150 Lebanese uh, lira to 700, seven, it went from 1500 to 7,500 overnight. Whoa. So it means you lost 80% of your money if you had it in a Lebanese bank. And so the answer, of course, is convert your lira while it's 1500 to the dollar into dollars before the devaluation. Right now, what can you do if you're a modern business person? Right. If I can't convert to dollars, the next best thing is buy something tangible that won't lose 80% of its value overnight. Buy a boat, buy land. Traditionally, people bought other tangible assets, gold, right? Something like that. But if you buy an asset which is valued based upon its expected future cash flows that are in that collapsing currency, that doesn't work for you. Mm. Like you could own a, every good business in, in Venezuela. How's that going to help you when the Venezuelan currency collapses by a factor of a million? Jesus. It won't. Okay, so what's Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is the strongest asset the human race has ever invented. It's like gold with none of the defects of gold. So define what the defects are. Why, why is it the greatest monetary invention? So I buy a uh, million dollars of gold. OK, um, if the price goes up, the gold miners, first of all, the gold miners are going to create more gold and dump it on the market. If I could eliminate uh, all gold mining forever, if I could wave a magic wand and make it impossible to mine more gold, my million dollars of gold will hold its value better because it'll be scarce. But gold miners are inflating the value of uh, the, the supply of gold by at least 2% a year or so. And then if the price doubles again, investors will invest in more gold miners and they'll create more capacity to mine gold. So you'll create capacity to mine gold, you'll mine the gold, you'll crank up the rate at which the gold mines function. After that, people with gold jewelry will melt their jewelry down, convert it to gold bullion and sell it, right? If, if the price of gold went up by a factor of 20, you would be like converting all your gold stuff into gold bullion because it seems like a good idea. They call it scrap gold, right? And then after that, um, bankers will issue gold warrants and gold and gold paper and gold derivatives, and they'll sell them short without the gold because they can speculate in it and they don't have to have a one for one coverage of gold to the gold derivatives. And so that's called hypothecation and rehypothecation. OK, if it keeps going up, the government's holding gold will start to sell some of their gold to manipulate the price down. Right. And, and all of these uh, and if it, and ultimately, if it goes up enough, someone will club you over the head and take your gold or a hostile regime will take your gold or a politician will pass a law taxing your gold. Right. There's a, there's a lot of ways you lose gold because it's physical. How do you cure the problem? Right. I mean, uh, here's how you cure the problem. You make it impossible to mine any more gold, and then you make it possible to take custody of your gold personally off of the exchange or off of the bank. 
So that way the bank can't hypothecate it or rehypothecate it. Miners can't inflate it. Investors can't create any more gold miners. And then you make it possible to move it from here to Switzerland or Singapore in an hour for, or for a nickel. And that way, if you don't like your bank or don't trust your bank, if the state of New York passes a law taxing it, you move it to the state of Wyoming. You know, if the government passes a law taxing, you know, the, the ownership of uh, land in California, you can't move the land out of California, can you? If you have a million dollars of gold in a bank and in a vault in New York City, you know, there's only a couple of places you can move it. You can move it to London if you have six months. <laughs> okay, so you're going to be subject to the law of London or the law of, of New York. Can you actually move to your favorite island or, you know, can you move to the Cayman Islands and bury your gold underneath your hut in the Cayman Islands and be safe about it? Not likely. Can't even get it through the airport. Right? So... So the problem with other properties, and gold is the simplest example, but the problem, the, the challenge or the analogy holds with any property. I give you a bunch of money and I tell you, you want to keep it and give it to your grandchild. Do you buy a building in Manhattan? Do you buy a ranch in California? Do you buy a stack of gold bars? Do you buy shares in a company headquartered in San Francisco? Do you buy bonds issued by a government or a company? Or do you buy Bitcoin? And you, you can see the problem, of course, is the, the debt is devaluing rapidly. The land in California can be taxed and is not movable. You know, uh, the building in New York is not going anywhere. It might be valuable to a rich person that lives in New York. What about a rich person that lives in Beijing? Do they want your building in New York? How are you going to hide your building, right? <laughs> Buildings get property taxed. There's a very famous story about, you know, a bunch of luxury, you know, yachts sitting in Sardinian port. And the locals decided that, the, that it wasn't fair that all these uh, people were rich people were sitting on their yachts in the port spending all this money, but they weren't paying enough taxes. Now, they're putting millions and millions of euros into the economy, but <clears throat> they came up with the idea that they were going to put a tax on the yacht, on the value of the yacht. And so they, you know, they passed a yacht tax that would have cost people millions or tens of millions of euros if they stayed in the, that port. And uh, everything was happy and uh, all the restaurateurs and the hotelers and, and, and the entertainment people in the port, they were all happy making tons of money off the yachts until the day before the tax went into place. And the morning that the tax went into place, the port was empty and the economy died. Every left because yachts are floating capital. It just moves. It's floating property, right? So it's it's a very visible example, right? Why it's not that smart to put a, a an a, an unfair tax or an extreme tax on a yacht if people can float the yacht to the next port, you know, a hundred miles to the left. So one would be discouraged <clears throat> from taxing stuff that floats. On the other hand, taxing a building that's buried, you know, a hundred feet down in the bedrock. That's easier. You can't move the building. So Bitcoin represents the apex property rights of the human race. Like I'm not, mind you, I'm not disputing the ability or, or the, you know, legitimacy of a government to pass a tax. At the end of the day, they can tax your gold. They can tax your stocks, your bonds, your building, yourself, your income, whatever they want. But the point really is you're a lot more likely to tax the stuff that you walk past you know, every day on the way to work and you're a lot and uh, legitimately you can move yourself and you can move your property if it's crypto to another jurisdiction, but you can't legitimately move a ranch in California. So your property rights are stronger and the value of the property is higher. <clears throat> right? You have a valuable thing in Manhattan. It's interesting to other wealthy people in Manhattan. But when you have Bitcoin, it's interesting to wealthy people everywhere on earth. Mm. Right? It's, you can liquidate a billion dollars of Bitcoin on the weekend in any currency, you know, any, any time. Try liquidating a billion dollar building. 
right? That's a three-year process, right? So it's liquid, it's fungible, it's desirable, and so that what that's what makes the asset valuable. And it's very it's the it's the most difficult thing to impair. Tom, once I had a million dollars seized by the Argentine government, here's how it happened. I had a million dollars in a bank in Argentina, in dollars, and it was a U.S. bank. Um, on, uh, on one day, they simply passed a law converting it all to pesos, and they, pa and they converted everybody's, everybody's account to pesos in the country. And the next day, they devalued the peso 10 to 1. And 24 hours after they'd, you know, done that, I had 100,000, whereas I had a million before. Mm. And they did it. I mean, they did it quickly and easily to everybody in the country. Now, in theory, you know, they, if, if it had been property, they would have had to pass a law seizing 90% of the property of everybody in the country. That would not be so popular, right, to seize the property. And if they wanted to seize 90% of the property of everything in the country, they would have had to subpoena a court in New York or Delaware <clears throat> and get my appearance, right? And there would have been three, four, five years of lawsuits going on. And if you really wanted to take something, you have to kidnap everybody and take them to jail and sweat their private keys out of them. And that's not very practical, right? So at the end of the day, it's not likely that, uh, that the governments of all the world will just confiscate 90% of your uh, of your crypto assets or your Bitcoin. But in fact, it's a foregone conclusion that they're definitely going to compensate 90 percent of your currency. Right? It's happening at one percent a month or two percent a month right now. So all you got to do is wait between five and 10 years and you're going to lose 90 percent of your purchase uh, of your money if it's in if it's in a currency or a currency derivative and they don't even have to pass a law. And I want to start us off actually with something that you said, which is the world is going through an unprecedented financial crisis, the greatest of our lifetime. Now, I want to know, one, why do you think crypto and everything else has crashed? And two, is there an opportunity in all of this disruption for somebody to take advantage of or not? Well, uh, if we look at the past year, what you've got is uh, a drawdown of all financial assets. So the NASDAQ is down about 22% over the past year. And so NASDAQ represents tech companies and all the risk assets. But on the other hand, if, if you were to go and look at like the bond uh, market and the bond portfolios, bonds are down uh, like the B-O-N-D index, the bond, long bond index, it's down six, almost 17% in the year. Oof. So for 30 or 40 years, you had this 60, 40 bond portfolio. And the because idea bonds was- bonds were considered a safe space? The idea was if stocks work, then, uh, then bonds will be a low return and stocks will be a high return. But if stocks trade down, people will shift their money to bonds and you'll, you know, the interest rates will go down the bonds uh, prices will go up and you'll actually get a yield on your bond portfolio. But of course, that broke around uh, March of 2020. And the reason it broke in March of 2020 is because interest rates got pegged to zero. So after we had lowered interest rates from 5%, five percent, five and a half to five to four and a half to four to three and a half to three to two and a half to two to zero and left it at zero. Then bond, you know, the, the debate was can can they take interest rates negative? If you can't take interest rates negative, then bonds don't act as a hedge to stocks anymore. I mean, you're kind of you're at the end of the road for bonds. And uh, and what we saw with stocks is the Federal Reserve printed a bunch of money, pegged interest rates at zero. And then you saw all these risk assets explode. You know, you saw the NASDAQ explode up and the S&P explode up. You had a K-shaped recovery. And in the K-shaped recovery, it's almost like the entire economy was in a train wreck or in a car wreck. And we got taken into the hospital and they pumped us full of morphine. You know, and if you've ever been in a bad accident and then first you're in pain, and then they pump you full of painkillers, and then you actually feel pretty good. 
and you're sitting there and your arm is broken, but you're high on morphine or high on something, you feel pretty good about it. And you're thinking, why don't I just go break my arm and do this all the time? And then at some point, there's part of your brain that says, you know, I'm going to come home from the hospital and I'm going to get off this painkiller and I'm going to be in great pain for the next three months or six months or whatever it is. So I think what happened here is the, the Fed just pumped tons and tons of liquidity and we stayed high for about a year, year and a half. And uh, I, I remember when uh, when Jerome Powell said, I'm not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates and the input and said strongly that it'll be till 2024 before interest rates start coming up again. But here we are in 2022. And now instead of uh, raising them a quarter point, you know, each time, now they're raising them 75 basis points. So Ooh. they're taking three steps at a time, multiple times. So we took the cost of money down faster than any time in history. And now we're jacking up the cost of money faster than any time in history. And the result is um, that uh, all the traditional models are broken. Let me, uh, let me give you a, uh, a two-year uh, post-mortem um, since we started uh, dealing with this issue. MicroStrategy had, we had, uh, we had a $500 million of cash and we saw interest rates at zero. And we saw the stock market inflated in the summer of 2020. And we, and we said, well, what are we going to invest in? And we looked around at everything. Should I buy gold? Should I buy land? Should I buy art? Should I buy some crypto asset? And what's going to happen next? So what we did is we decided to buy Bitcoin. And we bought $250 million of Bitcoin August 10th, 2020. And then uh, September, around September 10th or so of 2020, we bought another $175 million of Bitcoin or something like that. And then we started buying Bitcoin more in December and we, we kept buying Bitcoin. We ended up buying nearly $4 billion, $3.97 billion of Bitcoin over that time period. So, uh, so in terms of like our strategy, micro strategies just bought as much Bitcoin as we get our hands on since August 10th of 2020. And in that time period, stocks gyrated north, they gyrated south, uh, you know, currencies have changed. So let me, let me tell you what's happened. Micro strategy stock, our stock is up 93, 94% since that day. Whoa. Bitcoin is up 77% since that day. The S&P index is up about 18%. The NASDAQ index is up 7.5%. Gold is down 16%. The bond market, if you just bought bonds, they're down 18%. Bonds are down 80%. And silver, if you think silver was better than gold, it's down 32%. Jeez. Now, if you go on and say, okay, well, fine, let's just buy big tech. If you had bought uh, the the greatest of the big tech companies is Google. Google is up 41%. Apple is up 39%. Microsoft's up 22%. You might've won. Those were all better investments in the S&P. Much better than NASDAQ. Much better than gold. Not as good as Bitcoin. Not as good as MicroStrategy. But if you bought Amazon, you're down 18%. That was overvalued in the summer of 2020. Like, you know, a bunch of 20 somethings were just buying Amazon because they thought, well, we're all ordering Amazon stuff, so it must be good. Well, uh, when you buy something that everybody else understands to be good at the same time they all agree with you, it's normally bad. Yeah. Facebook is down 41% since then. Netflix is down 54% since then. So half the big tech got shellacked, the other half did pretty good. And now, Last point, what if you bought enterprise software? We compete against uh, companies 100 times as big as us. Oracle, SAP, Microsoft. Um, it, Oracle is up 39%. IBM's up 6%. Salesforce is down nearly 20%. SAP is down 45%. So 
Summary for us, micro strategy strategy was buy as much Bitcoin as you can and buy it with equity and debt. We borrowed money. We borrowed $2.2 billion at a blended interest rate of like 2% or 1.8%. So we borrowed cheap money while money was cheap and we bought Bitcoin. Now people are saying, that's stupid because Bitcoin was trading up and then it traded down. At the end of the day, if your time horizon is a decade or longer, if you can borrow, if you can borrow the money for longer than five or six years and you can hold it through the volatility, then uh, raising cheap money, grabbing billions of dollars at low interest, and then investing in a scarce desirable asset that's got sort of a technology appeal and holding it for a long period of time, that's going to be a good strategy. That's why our stock is outperforming Bitcoin. That's why... That's why we're outperforming all the enterprise software companies, all the big tech companies. And the reason Bitcoin's outperforming all the other asset classes is because it's scarce, it's desirable, it's technical. You know, no, no one's going to write a piece of software to make gold better. You're not going to put gold on a billion iPhones. Whereas Lightning is a protocol that's been rolling out lately. Uh, you know, Square Cash App or Blocked Cash App put Lightning right into Cash App. It means that you can send a hundred dollars of Bitcoin to anybody in the world on a Saturday afternoon for less than a penny, instantly, peer to peer. Before and so, we get to that, though, I want to I want to make sure that we humanize this for people that aren't as familiar with a lot of this. So, one part of the appeal yeah. of Bitcoin is also its volatility, which I've heard you speak about. But I think we have to build a few bricks before we get to that. So I've been going on a journey myself of really understanding investing and understanding what this all means. And so I get to play, not play, I really am the sort of ignorant guy, but smart enough to figure it out that's been going through this in real time with people. So I want to go back. So the first thing we do is we start lowering interest rates. Now, I want to understand why they're doing that. I have a thesis. Let me know if this is actually accurate. The reason that they lower interest rates is they're trying to goose the economy by, by making money cheaper so that entrepreneurs and other people will go and take that money or people that want to build a house, whatever. They can get cheap money. They can do something that creates activity in the economy. So whether you're buying lumber to build the house or you're you know taking on debt to grow your business, but you're doing things. Is that accurate? That's why they're lowering the interest rate is to try to get activity? They're trying to use monetary policy um, to, uh, to counteract the negative impact of fiscal and foreign policy and domestic policy. But so, what is the negative impact? Is it people just pulling back and not spending money? It's going to be important to, to get where I think we need to go. It's going to be important to understand why this stuff happens. When a government declares a war, they basically put public policy initiatives ahead of the interest of the free market. Right. So if I declare a war, I could just draft every single every single adult in the country, put them in the military, send them off. And if I lose the war, they're all dead. Right. What's it do to the economy? The economy crashes. Right. What's it do to the prices? Uh, well, the price of everything go up. If you want to create inflation, you do it two, uh, a couple of ways. Either you cut the supply or you increase the cut the supply of the product you want to buy or you increase the supply of the money that's available to buy it with. So if I uh, if I make it illegal to manufacture food. The price of food's going up. Right? I don't even need to print more money. Right, I can create inflation uh, just every in, in a war, like in World War II. We have uh, we have gas rationing. You have you have food coupons. Why? Because all the gasoline gets shipped off to Europe to put in tanks or to put in airplanes or put in ships. So, when you have um, when you have policies that are declaring a war on something, you divert resources. So we had a war on COVID. We have a war on carbon and energy war. If I decide I don't want you to burn coal or oil, then I drive up the price of energy. Mm -hmm. If I decide I don't want you to show up in your office, I drive up the price of, of production. If I if I decide that um, you know that uh, I want to fight uh, this COVID war, and I'm going to going to change the way the economy works, if uh, then I'm going to drive up the cost of everything else. So we've got lots and lots of wars. 
right? You've got a culture war. You've got a war on office work. You've got a war on carbon. You've got a war in the Ukraine. <clears throat> the war in the Ukraine has escalated, right? It's not just a war in the Ukraine. It's really a kind of a quasi-economic war on Russia. So when we actually imported Russian sanctions, we cut the amount of uh, uh, of gasoline or or the amount of fuel available in energy, we drive up the price of energy. So every single time you actually put a, a public policy in place, you create inflation. Pol policy is inflationary. The more policy Ooh, you have, can, let, let's the more inflation you have. I think this is going to be one of the key elements that uh, people need to understand. So centralized control, I think, is a core part of the thesis as to why things are breaking. So you have governments coming in top down. This is going to be the way that it is. And I've heard you say, and I would agree with this very much, let's assume that they're coming in with good intentions. But despite their good intentions, they're creating all kinds of problems. There's actually a, do you know Thomas Sowell? I don't. Oh, my God. I think you would really resonate with him. He's an economist, so you might discount him a little bit for that. But he uh, says the last 30 years have been marked by trading what worked with what sounds good. And I think that we're to your point about wars. Let's take the one on energy. So we've got people doing a green war, great intentions. They really believe in that they want to save the planet. But it in trying to help the patient, they are putting forward measures that do feel very warlike, that are closing off a lot of doors, that are making energy more expensive, that are going to disproportionately impact the poor, not just here in the US, but around the world. And so that, that top-down control, I know better, I know what to do with this knob, instead of letting it evolve or happen in the free market, we're gonna prescribe behavior. And that now, I would say, and I'd love to know if you agree, is if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest contributors to what's happening to the economy. Yeah, good. The road to hell is paved in good intent, right? People, uh, people uh, get into positions of power and they want to do good. And so they do good by issuing edicts executive orders, policies, regulations, and they think that the regulations will make things better. They believe that, that you know, if you, if you enter into government and politics, you believe the political process is a way to make the world better. So what you have is political organizations, centralized organizations getting progressively more powerful. And as they get more powerful, people do things. Right. And I think if you roll the clock back to Ronald Reagan, he would say, you know, government's the problem. Government's not the solution. So let's take uh, nuclear energy. Right. Uh, the, the cleanest form of energy is nuclear energy. It's it's the cleanest, probably the safest. Nobody died at Three Mile Island. Uh, you know, we can't we can't hardly trace a death from nuclear energy in the U.S., and yet we haven't built a nuclear power plant since the creation of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 50 years ago. And in Germany, they shut all theirs down. Right. And in Japan, Is they shut all theirs down. Is that just human psychology at play? Like this feels another key piece to the puzzle here as we look at why the collapse, how this happens, how we get back out feels like in is humans react in a very emotional way to what happens. So Fear. as... Yeah, exactly. And Terror. euphoria. So you get these two competing things that set something up weird. So this is the first cycle that I've lived through where I was paying attention like uh, somebody interested in the financial world. Till then, I was just an entrepreneur and just totally focused on that. And so I watched the euphoria grow in crypto and it was like exciting and thrilling and it was so fun. But there were people like I had heard you say a gazillion times, guys, you have to be thinking in at least four year increments and any thinking less than that is you're you're going to get tricked by the volatility and despite the fact that you and many other people were saying similar things the second the price starts dropping people panic the price starts dropping more people get liquidated because they were in way over their heads and now it's the sense of despair and it's never coming back and it's over forever and so there's like this this schizophrenic bipolar maybe is a better way to think of it attitude of like, we're up and we could never lose. And I don't need to plan for a down scenario. We're down and we'll never be up again. And 
how much of that do you think exacerbates the problem? If you're an entrepreneur or you're an, an investor, you have to have a 10 year time horizon and no, nothing great is accomplished without a decade. If you look at Microsoft, the company's founded in the mid seventies, a decade later in their mid eighties, you know, if you're not willing to hold Microsoft stock for a decade, you probably didn't get to the point where they came public. So a decade's a short period of time for someone who's an industrialist or, or an investor. I mean, Warren Buffett still owns Coca-Cola stock and he must have bought it 50 years ago, right? So I, you know, I think that in, in anybody you know that's a billionaire, right? All, all of these names, the Sergey Brins, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musks of the world, they didn't get there without without holding an asset that had technical potential for a decade or longer. There's no get rich quick scheme. So I think that uh, people want uh, they want a, a, an easy route. Uh, if you're trying to if you're trying to get a quick uh, a quick win with no volatility, with no risk, doesn't make sense. And if you're actually trying to be successful in a hurry with volatility, that probably still won't work either. I mean, ultimately, success comes from taking a, a, a decade-long view, right? Andrew Mellon, John D. Rockefeller, Jeff Bezos, right? We, we forget, like, Tesla was founded 20 years ago. Like, people think it's an overnight success, but it's not an overnight success. Um, and with regard to the, um, the macro picture, we live in an, uh, a time of unprecedented public intervention in the affairs of the economy. Right, uh, unprecedented. We never had a never in the history of the country did you have a government that told you you couldn't have Thanksgiving dinner with your family because they didn't want family members to sit too close to each other. Yeah, we arrested a dude on a surfboard in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for so for for basically paddle boarding in the middle of the Pacific because that was deemed as unsafe. Right, mm. that kind of stuff. So we have an unprecedented amount of encroachment. We have we have politicians overriding the free market. They tell you what kind of energy you can use. They tell you, you know, how how you how far you have to sit from someone. They tell you whether it's safe to be sitting in your office at a table next to someone. Lots and lots of encroachment. Each of these areas, right? Uh, war war is the suppression of the free market. Uh, to the uh, to the benefit of the public uh, or the public organization, right? The government is suppressing the free market. So if the government keeps suppressing the free market everywhere, what you do is you cripple production, right? Yeah, that's what we have tariffs on the uh, on Chinese imports, right? That the drive up prices up or down drives them up, right? You have you have a war on uh, on uh, or a labor war, right? If everybody unionizes and if everybody's afraid to go to work and if everybody's a, if everybody thinks that their life is threatened to stand next to another human being, right? And and uh, if we're afraid to trade with each other, and if we're afraid to talk with each other, right? If you if you have capital controls, wage controls, price controls, export controls, manufacturing controls. Right. As those things happen, they have a chilling effect on the economy. So what we have right now is on one hand, you have a supply side problem. Right. You're, we're not producing as much. The, the degree of not producing, by the way, is misunderstood. Uh, the currency weakened by 20 percent in the year after covid. If the economy measured in nominal terms is flat, that meant that the overall economic output decreased by 20 percent. The overall economic output decreased by 20% or more in the last two years. People wonder if we're in a recession. We've been in a recession since March of 2020. Mm -hmm. But what we have is a situation where all the metrics are distorted, right? For, for example, how many people would measure the economy based upon GDP output measured in dollars? Most. Is that the correct measure? No, right? Because the dollar is not worth what it was 24 months ago, right? So what if I told you look at it? You have to measure it in real terms or measure it in the, the actual output of goods and services. For example, how many airline miles got flown, right? Mm. If Emirates Airlines grounded half their fleet and decommissioned it after COVID, now they're up and running the part they didn't decommission. 
how is it possible that the air sector could possibly recover to the point where it was in January of 2020? If you've actually mothballed or decommissioned half the airplanes, right? I could double the price of a ticket. If I double the price of a ticket, I can tell you that the size of the airline industry is the same as it was in January of 2020, right? I could declare there's no recession. But the fact is, everything costs twice as much. There's half as much of it, right? I changed the way that I measured it. GDP measured in nominal terms is a gross distortion, and then CPI is a gross distortion. If I, if I have 100 things that you want, and I pick 10 of them, and I measure the increase in the price of 10, and I ignore the price in the other 90, I can show you a CPI is 8%, right? 8.3% is the number this morning. But the actual inflation rate is higher, but it's, it's inflation on something like it's inflation on something you want, but I'm not going to choose to measure. For example, you know, the 30 year bond is, is traded up to 350 basis points and it was 180, right? Mortgages have doubled. So mortgages have doubled, housing prices are up 35%. And that means, in, you know, in theory, the cost for you to actually buy a home is going to be 50, 60% higher year over year but I don't choose to measure it because we don't actually calculate CPI that way. I take a survey and I ask you whether or not you think you could raise your rent by something. And if the owner equivalent rent is up 3%, then I say that the inflation is three or five. Mm. So we have a set of metrics that are, that are just ma manufactured metrics. And then we focus on them and then we talk about them. But ultimately, um, what you have is an economy that's distorted. There are some things we produce more of, and there, is, uh, and there are some things we produce less of. And we have flexibility with what we choose to measure. The, okay, so, uh, the yeah. monetary intervention is the government basically, if I put everybody under home arrest for a year, it's going to be a problem for the economy, right? I mean, if, if I shut down, they did it in New Zealand, they did it in Australia, they did it in Canada, they kind of did it in certain states in the US. If I do that, that cripples the economy. So while I'm doing that, then if I go ahead and I pump a lot of money in the system, right, then maybe I, I create a wealth effect and I can say, well, you know, we're recovering. But ultimately, you never recover from the fact that nobody went to school for a year and no nobody you know went to work for a year right you can't you you've lost that forever you're just not measuring it you you can you can change your metrics right there's this there's a saying you write the the winners write the history books so the romans remember the carthaginians have been as being like evil Right. If if we win the war, then we write out all of the good that our adversary did, and we write up all the good that we did, and we suppress all the bad that we did because we won the war. We write the history books, and and so I think right now what you're what you see in the economy is lots of distortion of numbers, lots of distortion of metrics. Right. The fact that we have a debate over whether we are in a recession or not is, is kind of laughable, right? Because we've been in a recession for 24 months. If you are measuring the production of goods and services, mm. all you got to do is look at the variety of things that were available to you in January of 2020 versus the variety of things available to you today and the delays. If you've got one tenth the selection and it takes three times as long to get it and it costs twenty percent more, how are you not in a recession? Yeah, this is what really is um, I find unnerving as I go down the road of trying to figure all this out, trying to figure out where the opportunities are. Is I'm looking at what feels like, and again, I want to to give that it will be it's being done with good intention, but you have uh, a changing definition of what a recession is to match a thing that seems designed very explicitly to keep people calm. And uh, it seems the same thing with the Fed, right? The reason that they said, we're not even thinking about thinking about taking up rates. They just want to keep everybody calm. 
So we're told things not necessarily because they will be the most effective long term, or at least that the outcome is that they don't end up being effective, but they're looking at the short term impact of I want to make sure that people stay calm. And I'll admit if they were like, oh, my God, the world is burning and everything is bad, like then people are going to act like it's 10 times worse. And so that's why I feel like if I'm if I start putting the pieces together, there's really three pieces that I think give us the situation that we're in. Um, as you have said, people just don't understand money. And so you said half of the problems that we face as a civilization have to do with the fact that we do not understand money. That was pretty interesting. And then you've got this top-down control, so centralized decision-making, which is destined to fail historically, just looking at it, it does not work. And then the third thing is human emotion. And so you put these things together in a cocktail and you get the moment that we're living through. So you've got people freaking out. You've got other people know that you're going to freak out. So they're trying to control everything, trying to say, hey, I can make better decisions than you. I'm going to tell you sort of white little lies to get you where I need you. I mean, I, I think back to the mask statement right in the beginning. It's like they don't work. Actually, you need to wear them all the time. Uh, they didn't work when they wanted to save them for hospital employees. And suddenly they started working when there was enough for all of us to wear them. And so it's like, I get it again, good intentions, but without sort of a pathological fear of doing this top-down control, you get this issue. And then compound the fact, even if people wanted to think through the process for themselves, they don't understand it. And so I feel like I'm just barely beginning to understand how money actually works. And I think now we should get into... Um, Bitcoin as a thing that exemplifies some very powerful principles that will begin to help people understand. So the, the first thing that I'm going to say, and I say this knowing that you will correct me if I'm incorrect, but here is my understanding of what makes Bitcoin so interesting, that money is basically your financial energy put into a form that can be carried across space and time. Some forms allow you to carry across space and time easily, some not so much. But getting people just to understand that I go do a thing that is my physical energy, my physical labor, my time, my actual like turning uh, oxygen and food into ATP. And I'm actually able to put that into a medium, right? It could be gold, it could be uh, fiat currency, or it could be Bitcoin. But just getting people to understand, holy shit, like there's actually a way for me to do a thing receive a thing that allows me to carry that energy across time. And if, if you'll bear with me, it's like fat. So I can eat a bunch of food and I can store it on my body as fat. But if I'm really smart, I will eat a bunch stored on my body as fat and I will give a bunch away because I'm too full. I can't keep eating. I will give a bunch away and essentially store fat on their bodies. So the next time, if I don't get food, they do get food. So the idea of being able to transfer useful things across time and space in unique ways is really important. So Bitcoin comes along as certainly the newest entrant and maybe the best entrant of things that allow you to sock away your time and energy into that and carry it across time and space. Have I understood that correctly? I think that's well said. I mean, fundamentally, money is an energy system to, tr to transfer energy over time and space, right? That's the right way to think of it. Uh, fat is an organic battery. It's 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 your way to transfer organic energy. If you put twenty or thirty pounds of fat on your body, you can live for ninety days, right? And uh, if you don't, you don't eat, you die. So, fat was developed over the course of millions and you know seventy million mammalian years, and it's a pretty wonderful invention when you think about it. It's 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 the reason that we didn't go extinct or the reason you're not dead. Um, the, the challenge with money is uh, the fiat currencies that are used commonly as money, they're all broken. They all have a big hole in them. And, uh, and the, the big hole is inflation, period, end of story, or is there something else? The hole is, we could call it inflation, but inflation is such a charged term because most people think inflation is CPI. Uh, the defect in fiat currencies is monetary inflation. It's the expansion in the money supply, <clears throat> not just the increase in consumer goods, because the CPI is a distorted, it's a submetric, right? If if you look at the US dollar, the dollar is the supply of dollars has been increasing 7% a year for 90 years. 
it's been increasing 15 to 20 percent a year for the past two years Whoa. right right so the, the big idea think that's true so eh, it seems worth walk us through how where do you get that number well if you go back to 1930 my house in miami beach cost a hundred thousand dollars and if you roll the clock forward to 2000 and 12 it cost 14 million dollars and today it would cost you 40 million dollars so so it's 400 times more expensive than it was you know 90 92 years ago now if you back solve that you'll find that that works out to about a six percent or seven percent annualized inflation rate Right. And if you go and you look at any kind of scarce, desirable asset, something that's something that is uh, you can't make any more of, you'll find typically the increase in cost about 7% a year normally. You can actually see uh, if you look at the market basket of things people like want, like really good health care, really good education, uh, you know, a beach house in the Hamptons, uh, artwork, Picassos, right, that kind of stuff. That doesn't go up in price one or two percent a year. That goes up in price normally about seven percent a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at the at the price of a a basket of stocks, like the S and P, the S and P has gone up about ten percent a year. Well, the reason it's gone up ten percent a year is because the money supply expanded at seven percent a year, and then the underlying companies probably grew two or three percent, you know, effectively. So. Uh, you can figure this out for yourself if you just got, start to go and take samples of what stuff cost in 1971, what it cost in 1930, what it cost in in the year 1950. And what you'll see is that for anything that's really desirable, like uh, scarce energy uh, that has energy content, it doesn't go up in price 2%. Now the stuff that 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 uh, doesn't go up in price as expensive is stuff that's highly manufactured with low in low energy content, high information content. So for example, a streaming video on YouTube or something that could be stamped out in quantity 100 million at a time, mm-hmm. boxed food, right? Stuff, highly manufactured stuff uh, that has machines generating it or even better, you know, something that's got cheaper, right? It, it costs a lot of money to listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony if the orchestra plays it in 1850. But it costs not that much to listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony if you're listening on your iPhone through your AirPods, right? So if I can strip the mater- the matter and the energy out of the product, I can provide that to you very cheaply. So the information content products got cheap. But <clears throat> steaks, right? More expensive, although there's a slight benefit if you can manufacture 100,000 cows and I can use machines, right? Then there that's a deflationary thing. One thing you can't easily manufacture more of is three acres of beachfront property in the Hamptons. That's very difficult, right? And if you look at uh, the cost of a Palm Beach house, they're a hundred million dollars right now. Okay. So a hundred million dollars for a house on two acres or three acres in Palm Beach. Now ask yourself the question, why isn't that getting cheaper? That thing's going up a lot. So <clears throat> the problem coming back to money is, is um, fiat currencies <clears throat> aren't anchored in energy. Uh, when we were on the gold standard, theoretically, during the gold age, 1870 to 1914, if a, if a dollar uh, was convertible in a 20th ounce of gold, right, and you really pegged it hard to gold, <clears throat> then you're anchoring the currency into a hard asset. Now, gold isn't um, isn't um, fixed in supply. The gold supply increases at two percent a year, two to three percent a year. So, if you're on the gold standard, that means that the supply of money would be increasing at two percent a year, or in otherwise doubling every thirty five years. So, so money under the gold standard, perfectly executed bleeds energy every 35 years. It's got a half-life of 35 years. But that creates stable prices, Tom, because the economy grows at 2 to 3% a year. So if the economy grows 3% a year, if the money loses 3% of its value a year, then everything kind of stays stable, 
right? The demand increases, the supply increases, right? That's a good situation. In that case, you can save your money and 30 years from now, your money will be worth as much as it is today. Now, if um, if it turns out that you're saving your money and the supply of money is increasing at 7% a year, then the money is cut in half every 10 years, right? And so that means in 30 years, uh, the amount of money you have will be cut in half once, twice, three times. Wow. So you would you would have uh, 12.5% of your wealth in 30 years, <clears throat> saving money under the fiat standard, uh, under uh, under a 7% regime. Now, 7% was the about the rate that the US was inflating the dollar supply. But in the developing world, in weaker countries, uh, you would see them inflate the, dollar, the, the money supply about double that, 14%. So the half-life of their money is five years. The half-life of the dollar is 10 years. Most people don't even notice 10 years as half-life, except that anecdotally, if you asked anybody in the past 20 years, are you going to save your life savings in a checking account that earns 1% or 2% interest in dollars? They would tell you no. I, I know intuitively the cost of a college education is going to go up. The cost of a house is going to go up. I can't just save in dollars that generate 0% interest. So the so under the fiat standard, <clears throat> the money supply is expanding from 7 to 14% a year, depending on where you are, until we got to COVID. And in COVID, everything doubled. And so you started seeing a much more rapid collapse in the value of fiat currency. The U.S. dollar expanded the money supply uh, 15 to 20% a year. And so in the U.S., we expanded the money supply maybe 40%. And so U.S. single-family homes went up in price 40%. Oh, God. I think about the correlation. The price of a house is 40% higher than it was 24 months ago. The amount of money in dollars is 40% higher than 24 months ago. The number of houses are about the same. The number of people who want them are about the same. Makes sense. Now, if you go to other countries, if you look at uh, currencies outside the U.S. in the past 12 months, right? The Chinese currency is weakened 7%. Australian's down 8 The euro's down 15%. The yuan's down 15 The pound's down 17 South African rand's down 18 Polish zloty's down 18 And Japanese yen's down 24%. In dollar terms, what's happening? They're printing more money, right? It's even a bigger issue for them. The Japanese have pegged the 10-year interest rate at 25 basis points. And um, the US 10-year interest rate, right, is is uh, more than 10x that. The Japanese central bank is printing infinite yen in order to keep in order to buy every bond and keep the price of bonds much, much higher than they would otherwise be. So they're holding up the price of bonds by pumping yen in the economy. And the reason as they do that, the yen crashes against the dollar. But of course, it's even crashing faster against scarce desirable assets. If you price a barrel of oil in dollars, it just got 24% more expensive so in Japan. why would they do that? Because they want to hold up, prop up asset prices. They want to pro- They have institutions that are holding bond portfolios of yen, and the they have institutions holding stock portfolios. And if they stop printing yen to hold up the asset prices, those those uh, portfolios of assets will crash. And, and if that's they crash, worse than the inflationary impact. Well, if those portfolios of assets crash, then the banks or the investors that hold them will be technically insolvent and go bankrupt. If I'm a bank and I have $10 billion of assets and seven or $8 billion in loans outstanding, then I look solvent. But if those assets are in sovereign debt and the sovereign debt crashes by two or $3 billion, I'm technically insolvent. It creates a banking crisis or a financial crisis. But wh- so- it, it gets like worse than this, point... right, Tom? It's, that, that's the good news. Those are strong countries. Great. The bad news is like Sri Lanka, Argentina, Turkey. Now, are and those if, the same thing just played out on a longer timeline? The, those are examples where the government's printing even more money. So, for example, the t- cost in Turkish lira up 120% over 12 months. So the Turkish lira is crashing more than 50% against the dollar. 
the Argentine peso is crashing. In Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka crashed the entire economy and the government. How'd they do it? Well, first they uh, they made it illegal to use fertilizer to grow crops, and they kind of crushed the the farming business. Then they um, they printed too much money under a modern monetary theory that they could just print money, so they crashed their currency. Then they couldn't afford to buy fuel. They couldn't buy energy or gasoline. So then they actually regulated the use of gasoline by saying that private citizens couldn't actually buy gasoline. Then the people rioted and they toppled the government. Because if you're going to starve me to death and freeze me to death and then lock me and, and deprive me of my car, right? You you pretty much like ripped me back to the Stone Age, right? You're going to freeze to death, walk everywhere, and there's no food to eat. Why? Because it got excessive government intervention, right? The these ESG policies that are totally irrational. So you can have irrational policies Sorry, if you're let's rich. Let's go. Let's go into ESG because this is actually super controversial. Yeah, uh, but very interesting. So for somebody that doesn't know what an ESG policy is, what is ESG? It's when I decide that um, that say nuclear power is bad, but solar power is good, but natural gas is bad, but wind power is good. When when you start to decide and dictate how people will generate energy, right? And and or or when I decide you can't use fertilizer in order to grow food, was because, that also a green decision? Yeah, because fertilizers have phos phosphates in them, and they decide the phosphates are bad for the water, and so they didn't want people to not use them. So as the as the government starts to implement policies about how you will or will not produce food, how you will or will not produce energy or heat, what happens is ultimately they drive up the price of food, right? If you don't use fertilizer, then your crop yields get cut in half. If your crop yields get cut in half, food price doubles. If you're not allowed to use gasoline and you have to use a you know electric powered car, the cost of the car doubles. Crop prices, your food price doubles again. Now it's four x as much. If I if I double the money supply by printing a bunch of money to give to someone to pursue some aim that I agree with, now the price doubles again. So I've increased the price of everything by a factor of eight. How dangerous it's, do you think this moment is for the U.S.? It's pretty dangerous. <laughs> We're the richest company, a country in the world, though. So the U.S. the U.S. Um, has the world's reserve currency. So if you think about the way the economy worked 24 months ago, um, the uh, the the countries like China, uh, sorry, countries like Russia and the like, export a a trillion dollars worth of raw materials, like uh, energy and metals and the like. And then countries like China export a trillion dollars worth of products and services. And we pay for them by sending back $2 trillion worth of dollars. So what we do is we export $2 trillion worth of inflation, and they export $2 trillion worth of products and services and energy because we run the banking system of the world, right? The banking network plus the US dollar is the world reserve currency. Really is, fast, I need to ask because I don't understand. So yeah. when we send them the $2 trillion, we are creating that money in order to make those purchases? Yeah. So we're not just taking money that we've already saved? Let's say there's $50 trillion circulating around the world and we just print $2 trillion more. Now there's $52 trillion. We've inflated. Uh, We've inflated the currency supply by 4%. We've devalued everything by 4%. And we've traded $2 trillion worth of US dollars for $2 trillion worth of coal or oil or products or iPhones or labor or something, right? And, and that's the way it works, right? And, and the reason it works though, what, what is the real export the US provides? Financial economic security. Like, for example, if you live in Mexico or you live in Argentina and you've got a million dollars, are you going to save it in the peso? You're going to save it in the dollar, right? 
how are you going to save your money? If you um if you export a uh, hundred billion dollars of oil from the Middle East and we give you back a hundred billion dollars in dollars, what are you going to do with a hundred billion dollars? You buy T bills with it, <clears throat> so you buy sovereign debt that yields two percent interest. And so now if you hold a hundred billion dollars worth of sovereign debt, now if I double the money supply, it's worth half that much, right? So, so in essence, if I'm increasing the, the supply of dollars by 7% a year, and if you're holding a hundred billion dollars of my debt, then you're paying $7 billion a year to hold the debt. So I'm charging you $7 billion for the privilege of giving you a bank to put your $100 billion in. It's a negative interest rate, right? Negative real yield. If you, if you do it 10 years in a row, I take $70 billion from you. Whoa. But the question is, what else are you going to do? You're going to put in gold? If you have a billion dollars, what are you going to put it in? Well, the Russians put it in gold. We just seized the gold. You're going to buy a yacht with it? We might, we might take the yacht. You're going to buy land with it? Whose land? Land in another country? I already own all the land in my own country, right? So, so um, the U.S. primary export is inflation. That's what we do, and it's a good it's a good situation, right? We're running the banking system and we're printing more money. That our primary export is monetary, call it monetary technology in the form of the U.S. dollar. It's the most desired instrument. And what we trade for it is uh, is we get energy or we get products or services in return for exporting the dollar, right? Right now we're on this cusp because we're exporting too many dollars. And, uh, and that causes the collapse of other con- countries' currencies. And when their currencies collapse, their governments collapse. So the U.S., the U.S. won't collapse. The, the first countries to collapse will be Zimbabwe, Lebanon, Syria, right? Iraq, Iran, right? Uh, not uh, Any country, not Iran, but, but Afghanistan, Iraq, South America, all throughout, you know, they're, they're all being destabilized, Sri Lanka. So what you have is you have this rippling wave of destabilizations in the developing world. You have a weakening in the developed world. As their currencies weaken, they're going to suffer from inflation. If we have inflation that's 8% in the US dollar, and if the Japanese yen weakens 24% against the US dollar in one year, and if the Japanese have to buy oil priced in dollars, what's their inflation rate going to be? Now, right now, <laughs> the government, the official figures, they'll tell you it's low, but and uh, you can do that as long as you as long as you define the metric. But there's only so long you can do it at the point where nobody can actually afford to buy gasoline or buy energy, and their cars don't run, and they can't heat their home. Right then, you you can no longer uh, persuade the public that there is no inflation problem. Then you have a problem, and now the question is, how are you going to deal with it? And of course, there's how does the government deal with it? Uh, first, they'll persuade you that they won't count this in, an, they won't include. Have you ever heard the phrase a core inflation doesn't include the highly volatile food and energy? I haven't no, but that right, there's sounds... there's actually an inflation measure, core inflation that does not include food and energy. So first, I'll try to persuade you not to actually pay attention to the cost of food and energy. But uh, at yeah. some point, I'll accept it. But I will I will pick a different measure of food and energy. I'm not going to measure the cost of a steak. I'm going to measure the cost of a soybean burger. Right. I'm I'm going to measure the cost of of manufactured, you know, agricultural grain products that are cheaper. I'm not going to measure the cost of of some organic vegetable that's more expensive. So you'll see a distortion of that. And then at some point, you see a normalization of behavior. Like there's the old World Economic Forum meme, you know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Mm. 
It's like, well, I've decided that eating meat is bad for me. Like, so first you can't afford it. Now you, now it's bad for you to eat it. So I'm not really upset that I can't afford it because it was bad anyway. Or, um, you know, if you're a patriot, you're not going to actually cool your home below 80 degrees in the summer, and you're not going to heat your house. You, uh, you remember during the energy crisis, you don't remember this, in the 70s, right? It was your patriotic duty to turn the thermostat down in the winter and turn the thermostat up in the summer. So this happens in wars too, right? In a war, it becomes your patriotic duty to do without there's another idea that you've introduced me to around um, Bitcoin. I will choose to interpret it to carry beyond Bitcoin, though I know your thoughts and feelings, uh, at least vaguely, about Ethereum. But uh, this idea of the value of an irreversible transaction and what that's going to mean for cyberspace, um, I would... I, I, if you know exactly what I'm talking about, we can just go right into it, or I can give you a paraphrase of uh, when I heard you discuss this. Would that help? You can go and paraphrase me, but I think I know what you're talking about. Okay. So like? yeah, I, I think this is really, really interesting. So you said this, this part is a quote, uh, everything we've built in cyberspace, there's shadows of reality. As much as we tell ourselves, we built something functional. It's a gross monstrosity of something functional. And now this is my commentary on that was on the above quote, he was explaining why you need irreversible transactions to replicate matter, giving bits the same properties that physical things have, including their adherence to the laws of physics, so that things inside of cyberspace matter. And I that really blew me away because it put words to an idea that I've been trying to explain to people why, because I got into um, cryptocurrency, not because I, I didn't understand money investing. I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking about entertainment, building an entertainment company, this new technology that was going to let me do all this cool stuff. But then that leads you to learning and exploring and all that. But the thing <clears throat> that I kept trying to get people to understand was it, now it's like six or seven years ago, somebody introduced me to NFTs. They weren't called that back then. And I was like, oh man, like this is digital scarcity. This is going to change my business forever. And then I promptly forgot about it because it wasn't ready. And flash forward to 2020 and I get reintroduced to it. I'm like, oh, this is that digital scarcity thing. But I've always used the words digital scarcity. And it never, like I can see in the person's eyes, it doesn't land the way that I want it to land. But when you started talking about why people need irreversible transactions, that if you throw a rock off of a bridge, it is going to fall down and there is no way to take that back. That's just what gravity does. I was like, OK, that's, you know, the fact that water flows to gravity allows you to build hydroelectric dams. Uh, the fact that an internal combustion engine works is because it adheres to laws of physics that are entirely predictable. And so by creating uh effectively entropy in the system because people's pushback is why would you create an irreversible transaction that's just going to facilitate fraud if you could undo it if somebody were money laundering or whatever you could undo that and you said when god said let there be light he introduced entropy but that things adhering to entropy and the laws of physics is what allows you to build all these things on top of it and that changed my perception of why this is when i think about building cyberspace for real, uh, that that very thing is critically important. I think you've now moved us into the domain of technology, right? I'm, when I talk about Bitcoin, I'd say it's an economic imperative because it's it's perfected money. It's a moral imperative because it's the ability to give property rights to 8 billion people. But it's also a technology imperative. It's a technical imperative <clears throat> because it represents uh, technology to introduce conservation of energy into cyberspace or in, to create uh, matter and energy in cyberspace, digital energy. And, uh, and uh, if you can actually introduce physics, conservation of energy, thermodynamics into cyberspace, then you can not only clean up cyberspace, but you can empower uh, cyber actors, you can empower individuals. You can, uh, if you combine that with the power of cryptography, and you know the crypto ethos 
you know, that you're referring to is, is how do we actually give individuals the ability to own something without asking permission of another organization? How do you own it? If it's an, if it's an NFT, how do you own that right? And how do you, you know, the smart contract idea is how do you have the right to enter a smart contract without uh, a trusted intermediary, right? Without asking, without asking permission of or relying on a bank or or a, a legal team or a court system to enforce your right, right? Um, th this idea of of cyber rights right cyber process cyber property cyber energy it's a big idea <clears throat> and i think um i think the reason i think that bitcoin is so powerful is is because if i can create a billion dollars of energy a billion dollars of money that is transferred between two actors in cyberspace simply by transferring private keys or through any number of other processes right and i can do that in a millisecond then i can do that a million times a second i could do it a billion times an hour i could do it a billion times an hour programmatically now i've created um high velocity intelligent money high velocity intelligent property right and the applications are you know are manifold you can change the way sales systems work you can change the way marketing works <clears throat> you can change cybersecurity to your point and in, in, in the real world i can i can build structures in the real real world i can build a wall in the real world and you run into it right and i don't have to sue you to stop you from running through the wall if i had to sue you you would go through the wall murder me and my family and 18 years later or 8 years later my appeal would get to the 37th circuit court and they would find out that you had broken the law i would be dead you know all the carnage that follows for the next 8 years would have already taken place and i would have the court system so courts don't work to create physical security any more than you know you can build a bridge with matter and i can walk across a crevasse and if i required a legal bridge i'd walk across the crevasse plunge to my death and 18 months later they would determine that i should be able to stand but i can't so you can't engineer anything in in the world of it you're based on politics and right now right now uh the cyberspace is a political construct and it is not a physical construct. Money in cyberspace is political money. If uh, if you ask me for $100 and I send it to you via credit card, I can DK the deal. I can go to my credit card company, my bank and say, uh, I didn't really do that transaction. They'll reverse the transaction tomorrow and you'll lose the money. Consequences? Well, what if you ask me for a billion dollars and I ask you for a billion dollars of stuff? Okay, so I want you to give me 10 ships. I'll give you a billion dollars. And the next day, I just reverse the credit card transaction and keep your ships. This is a problem, right? Trade breaks down because there is no way to settle in a, in a final fashion. Now, what if... Um, what if you wanted to come and you wanted uh, to interfere with a million people online and do $10 of damage to each one? Well, you're going to do $100 million of damage using a bot. How do I charge you $100 million for doing that damage? If I try to charge with a credit card, it doesn't work. So you get to do $100 million of damage. Uh, with uh, with no risk because there is no consequence. If we actually have uh, digital money, true digital money, which represents digital energy, then I can actually say to you, every time you uh, cross this threshold, you have to post $10. And if you cross the threshold with a million bots, you have to post $10 a million times, you have to post $10 million. And if I say, after you've crossed the threshold, if you then attempt to murder me, or after you cross the threshold, if you slime me 
if you know, post a phishing site that's going to defraud me, if you do that a million times, it's going to cost you the forfeiture of your deposit. So you lose $10 million. Do it 10 million times, could cost you $100 million. If you want to wage in a high speed at phishing attack on me, you can do it. It'll cost you $100 million. That is the equivalent of driving a hundred million dollar truck into a hundred million dollar plane into a wall, right? Something or a hundred million dollar ship into a wall. There are real consequences. So when I when I say Bitcoin represents digital energy, what I'm really saying is when Satoshi invented a way to transfer a million dollars of value from me to you without a trusted intermediary or third party. Not only did they solve the problem of how to move a million dollars of energy, they also solved the problem with, of how to manifest a million dollars of energy in the digital realm. If I can move it, I can create it and I can store it. So now I can hold a million dollars of energy. Now I can hold a million dollars of energy. I have created, I, God said, let there be light, right? Satoshi said, let there be light. In essence, Satoshi created, he, he, Satoshi made it shine in cyberspace. I say some has created a fire in cyberspace, brought light. Light is energy. And ultimately, energy is matter. Matter is energy. We introduced matter and energy into cyberspace with this idea of a decentralized network, right? Uh, and once we've done it, you know, you can't. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. For the most part, um, we haven't seen the breakthrough applications in cyberspace that will use it. But the but the applications are pretty obvious. For example, you know, if I made people post uh, ten dollars worth of digital money in order to uh, view a YouTube video, it would be a ten dollar deposit once in your life. It's no impact on any person because it's a $10 deposit and you get it back, right? And it actually, it probably accretes in value. But on the other hand, when I go on YouTube and I see Michael Saylor, you know, scam videos with 20,000 fake viewers, you know, sometimes 50,000 people spin up fake YouTube videos with 50,000 fake listeners. If they had to post $10 each, it'd be $500,000 fake phishing attempt. Mm -hmm. It's not worth $500,000. And so the scammers and the fishers, they would not engage in that behavior if they were penalized uh, via security deposits. So you would clean up all manner of, you know, when I post on Twitter, the first 18 comments are bots. Mm -hmm. It's actually a CZ bot saying, why is nobody talking? You can actually see them. They're right in front of you. 37 comments in the first second. The reason they do it is there is no cost to maliciousness because cyberspace doesn't have conservation of energy. And creating a world, a, a, a beautiful world without matter and energy, right? It's like you want to create a city, there's no friction and there's no materials and there's no energy. You can't do it. What you're creating is this you know, this virtual world that's full of monstrosities because one, what if I could just snap my fingers and create a hundred billion demons to invade every everybody's stream and everybody's room and everybody's head and just bark at you nonstop. And I could do that for a penny. All it takes is one person in the human race to infect everybody with demons. And that's happening right now on Twitter. It's happening in, in social media. You have 0.1% bad actors that are responsible for half a million to a million fake accounts a day on Twitter. Whoa. Like you can't, st that's 300 million fake accounts a year. You can't stop them because it doesn't cost anything to launch them. And, and so in essence, the toxicity that's being pumped into the economy is extreme. Well, there's a lot of other applications of digital energy, but but ultimately, the reason this matters is the velocity of money, uh, of political money through cyberspace using a credit card is about six per year. 
Like I, I can send you $500 on a credit card. It takes 90 days to settle. So I can move the money six, seven, eight times a year. The velocity of digital, what's the, what's the, the kilohertz frequency of a nice song? Yo, 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 if I sing to you, think about the vibration and the velocity, you know, uh, and the frequency of that to create music. What's the frequency of a laser beam? What's the frequency of gravitational beams? Like, if you look at the way physics works, you're going to have to move stuff a million times a second, not six times a year. The velocity of digital energy is billions and billions, not six. It might be six billion. Six billion times as fast, right? Like that's how do tides work? That's the moon talking to the earth, right? <laughs> Weather patterns. You walk across the, you know, the floor, friction, heat exchange, vibration, right? All of these things, they're all critical uh, to the way the universe works, but they're also critical to the way the civilization works. And right now, what we have is <clears throat> cyberspace. It just doesn't work. Works. It's defective, and and everything in it, you know, that could be beautiful is ugly. If we want to clean up cyberspace, we need digital energy. But but. You know, it's it's the same as you look at New York and you've got skyscrapers built of steel up 100 stories. And if I shred it and I tell you, you got to rebuild it with balsa wood, what do you get? And that's that's cyberspace without digital energy. It's like, what do you have? You have these amorphous structures that, that collapse under their own weight over time. And, and or inflict massive pain and inefficiency in the economy. So just as I would say the money being defective, that the cost of defective money in the economy is 10, 20, 30 trillion dollars a year. It's some it's some obscene amount of economic inefficiency because you know, like nothing works, right? Every, all, all of your working capital bleeds energy at a ferocious rate. Well, the cost of uh, of having an ineffective materials in cyberspace is the same, right? It's like you, you stop using a social media thing because the news feed is toxic because it's so unpleasant or it's uh, it's uh, dangerous, right? So Bitcoin represents like the first and the greatest instantiation of digital energy. and uh, and the obvious application is just a uh, store of value in cyberspace. And that was the first application. The other applications are coming. People have yet to work them all out in their head. And many of them are going to be based upon proprietary protocols and lightning protocols and the like. But I think if you're a technologist, you can't ignore it. Because um, if you want to build structures that are functional for a billion people that are stable that'll last a hundred years yeah you, you have to do it with crypto steel you have to do it with with the equivalent of of the reared in metal right of cyberspace something which is a hundred x better and in, in fact this is this is not a hundred x better than a credit card company these credit card companies move money six times a year and then after the sixth time, they've taken 15% of the money. Whoa. Right? Th think about two and a half percent transaction fee six times. So you can move a billion dollar block of money six times a year for $150 million. That's what happens right now. And it only works for a small portion of the civilization. What if I told you you could move money six times a second or six times a millisecond for nothing. The money, not only is it bleeding 15% of its value a year uh, due to transaction fees, it's bleeding another 15% of its value a year due to the uh, devaluation of the base unit currency. So you're losing 30% of your value of your money or your, your money is cut in half every 
two and a half years. Like that's, that's like building a ship, you know, with balsa wood. Wooden ships might last 20, 30, 40 years. A steel ship will last hundreds of years if you patch it correctly. You know, why don't you just build a ship out of bubble gum, you know, or taco shells, right? It's like, it's, the materials are so defective that you laugh because you wouldn't even bother, right? I mean, you wouldn't even bother to try to cross the Atlantic, a, a ship full of taco shells, you know, with cotton candy or rubber bands holding it together. It's just a joke. But that's kind of what we have in many cases in the digital realm right now. We have imperfect materials and the, and the struggle, the real fight in the crypto world is how do I define a crypt? How do I, how do I create a crypto system that has a reasonable chance of holding its integrity and security a hundred years from now? Right. That's why there's this obsession over, well, you know, node size. I can't, I can't centralize the nodes. I want everybody to run their own node. I don't want nodes to run on AWS or Google. I want everybody to run this. I, I want it to run on hardware, you know, on a Raspberry Pi in my house. I want everything open. I want anybody, I want it to be outside the control of a company. I don't want a foundation. I don't want a nation state. I don't want anybody to get too influential. I don't want to be organized. I don't want a centralized group of developers. I don't want developers to be able to do anything to it. The, the doing of things is what's causing all the problems in the world. It's, mm. it's well-meaning centralized actors that want to help you, and they keep introducing this policy that they apply to everyone that creates that introduces fragility into the civilization and inadvertently is crippling to all of us. I think that's the opportunity we have if we if we properly understand this technology. We have the opportunity to, <clears throat> to create things of beauty and substance that exist in the digital realm beyond the reach of a political institution or a commercial institution. So at 1997, it was growing at 63% a year and there was 140 million users of the internet. In 2021, there are 140 million crypto users, and it's growing at 113% a year, Jesus. double the speed. Now, this is where humans struggle, linear numbers and exponential numbers. 